of Act 64, Section 21, uh, the Office of Legislative Council calls the first meeting of the Legislative Study Committee on Wetlands to order. This is that meeting. Um, you are now convened. Uh, the first thing on the agenda is for me to review the legislative charge to the committee. Uh, you should all have a copy of this, but it is also on the web and I'm going to walk through it uh, on the screen as well. First, you'll see that there's the creation with the general purpose for the committee to clarify the state wetland statutes and permitting under the statutes. Then you'll see the creation, the membership, I won't walk through that, and the assistance, you're getting the assistance of Ledge Council and the IFO. Then you come to subsection D, the report. On or before January 15, 2020, you, your committee, submit the written report to the General Assembly to update and clarify the requirements for the regulation of wetlands under state statute. And the report takes the form of draft legislation. And then it, this is where you get the, the four specific charges to your committee. Whether the definition of wetlands should be amended, including whether the definition of wetlands under state wetlands law should be based on objective criteria, such as size or location. Two, the standard by which the state shall review a permit application for the disturbance of a wetland or wetland buffer. Three, proposed exemptions from regulation under state wetlands law for specific activities, including whether land on which farming or a subset of farming is conducted should be excluded from the definition of wetlands subject to state regulation, or should be exempt from wetlands permitting under state law. And then 3B, whether the exemptions under state wetlands law should be consistent or similar to the exemptions under federal wetlands law. And then four, proposed permitting fees for wetlands permits. You are directed to select a chair from among your members at the first meeting. And you cease to exist on January 15th, 2020. And then on page three, line six, you have reimbursement and compensation authority for six meetings. The money is appropriated from the General Assembly. Do you have any questions? The, the only thing I might go is uh, we had uh, pages one through three. Yeah. And I didn't see that, some of that material that you were in. Okay, what did you not see? Was there four, was there four purposes? There's four. Uh, directives for you to address in the legislation. On page two, line one, whether yeah. the what definition of weapons should be amended. Page two, line four, the standard to review a permit application for the service. Yeah. Three, which includes subdivisions A and B, whether a land on which farming or a subset is farming should be excluded from the definition of weapons or should be exempt, and whether the exemptions under state weapons law should be consistent or similar to exemptions under federal wetlands law, and then the proposed permitting fees, which is line 14, those are the four. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's appropriate now, but it's, I've been sort of trying to remember why we find ourselves here, and I, I see there's an overview of wetlands law mm -hmm. coming, but I didn't know if we could maybe have that clarity now before we figure out the committee structure? Or? Yeah, I think Michael's going to go over that. So, um, I was directed to do an overview of wetlands law, but I also wanted to address why the four charges to you are part of this committee. Maybe that's good. And in doing so, in walking through mm -hmm. the overview, I'm gonna point out where the tensions are and, and why you are here. So I could do that in narrative form right now, or you can open um, this document, this document, which is what I'm gonna walk through right now. That's okay. 
So <clears throat> this is a, a chart of state wetlands permitting that I came up with is not totally 100% accurate. It leaves out detail from the wetlands rules. Um, but it's a general overview of wetlands permitting law and some of the issues that are coming up, which is why you are here. So the first thing you ask when you're looking for a wetlands permit under state law is, am I disturbing a wetland? And, and disturbing is shorthand that I'm using. It's if you're going to do development or a land use or an activity in a wetland or a wetland buffer. And then you look at the definition of, of, of wetland. It's those areas of the state that are inundated by surface or groundwater with a frequency sufficient to support significant vegetation or aquatic life that depends Saturated or seasonally saturated in conditions for growth and reproduction, such areas include marshes, swamps, slopes, potholes, fens, river and lake overflows, mudflats, bogs and ponds, but excludes excludes such areas as grow food or crops in connection with farming. So on the back page of your big flow chart, you'll see the federal definition of wetlands. So chart one is whether or not your definition of wetlands under state law needs to change. And if you see the definition under federal law, it really isn't that different except for the excluding such areas as grow food or crops in connection with the farm. Now I'm going to come back to that excluding clause in a second, but first I want to talk about what a buffer is because you need a permit if you're going to be disturbing a wetland or a buffer. So the buffer is the zone, the area contiguous with a significant wetland that serves to protect the values and functions to be preserved by its designation. And the buffer zone for a class one wetland is at least, at least 100 feet from the wetland border. And the buffer zone for a class two wetland is at least 50 feet from the wetland border. It can be more than 100, it can be more than 50. The A and R designates <coughs> the need for that to so that's at least 100 and at least 50. So that's what you're talking about. That's the zone of activity that you're working in. Are you disturbing a wetland or a wetland buffer? So do I need a permit for my activity in a wetland or a wetland buffer? Well, first question, are you growing food or crops in connection with farming? Because remember, that's, that's excluded from the definition of wetlands. Well, you say, yes, I'm, I am growing crops. Well, then you have to ask, has the farming activity be, been contiguous since 1990? Well, where did that come from? That's not in the definition of wetlands, right? That's not in statute that, that, that it's excluded if it's been continuous since 1990. That's in, in a rule of the Agency of Natural Resources that puts a condition on the exclusion of areas grown for food or crops from the definition of wetlands. So, so the agency adopted that by rule. When when was it adopted? That was adopted in nineteen in nineteen ninety. Or eighty nine? Eighty nine or nine. Right. So what you also need to realize is that statute says when A and R adopts a rule that affects farming, the Secretary of Agriculture Food and Markets needs to consent to that rule. Similarly, if the agency of natural resources is going to adopt a rule that affects forestry or forestry operations or silviculture, as the language says, the Commissioner of Forests and Parks and Recreation has to consent to that rule. Nobody can find a record of the Secretary of Agriculture consenting to the 1990 provision. So that 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 is something. I'm 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 not saying it didn't happen. I'm not saying that it did happen. Nobody has a record of that. <clears throat> well, and, and we and the Ag Committee spent quite a lot of time looking and asking for that, and I think you looked into it extensively for us. Right? Right. So why is that why is that a difference? Because the environmental court says if you were farming and you're continuous since 1990, you're excluded, you're not part of A&R's jurisdiction. You're outside the jurisdiction of A&R. So that wetland isn't an A&R 
our wetland and wouldn't be subject to a &R jurisdiction according to the environmental court. It says outside the jurisdiction of a &R. So who regulates that wetland that's been in farming since 1990? Well, the Agency of Agriculture does because the RAPs regulate all farming. So for wetlands that, that have been continuously farmed since 1990, AR doesn't regulate them, the Agency of Agriculture regulates them under EPRAPs just as general farming. It doesn't say specifically wetlands, but it's, it's a regulation that that land is subject to. So what, another issue is that when AR defines what is farming underneath the statute and the rules for the purposes of the exclusion, they did not use the default definition of farming. And the default definition of farming is the definition in 10 PSA 6001. Turn over your sheet. The purple um, is the definition of farming. I'm, I'm not gonna walk through that, but you'll see that it is different from the green definition of farming. The green definition of farming is how a &R has defined farming under the wetlands rules. And it means the cultivation or other use of land for growing food, fiber, crystal seeds, maple sap, or horticultural and orchard crops, and the growing of food and crops in connection with the raising, feeding, or management of livestock, poultry, equines, fish, farms, and beef for profit. So that's really very focused on growing food or crops. But there are a lot of other activities that are farming, that farmers argue are necessary for farming. Whether it's a farm road, whether it's a farm structure, whether it's a manure pit, whether or not it's your fertilizer storage, whether or not it's your bunker. Farmers are saying that is farming that is necessary in order to grow food or crops. But a &R might not interpret their definition of farming to include those types of activities. And so that's a tension because when you go to the other side of the chart and you look at the uses exempt from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Clean Water Act 404 permit, you'll see a lot of farming activities that are exempt. Farm roads are exempt. Maintenance of structures are exempt. Farm ponds are exempt. So there's a lot of things, plowing, seeding, cultivating, that are exempt under the federal rules. And so that's one of your charges. Is are these exemptions, is this exclusion going to remain an exclusion? Is it going to be the definition of farming that ANR has in the wetlands rule? Is it going to be the definition of farming that the agency of ag regulates under the RAPs? Is it going to be a type of farming that's defined underneath the federal Corps rules or more similar to their exemptions? So that's a big part of your charge. And what is part of that charge is looking at language in, in Act 64 from this past year, which gave the Agency of Agriculture authority under the RAPs to regulate wetlands that are used for um, areas as, as grow food or crops in connection with farming energy. So the Agency of Ag has RAP authority over that, so those wetlands. And the question there is, do they regulate farming, the purple box, or do they regulate farming under the green box? Well, the agency of ag is going to say in the legislative intent letter from Senator Starr and Representative Partridge said, no, it's farming on the, the purple box, the Act 250 definition of farming, because that's a statutory definition, and that statutory definition takes control over a rule, because under state Vermont Supreme Court precedent, when a statute and a rule conflict, the statute so there's arguably a conflict between the language that gives the agency of ag authority over wetlands used for farming and then the a and wetlands rule and how it defines farming. So that's another thing that you 
you will have to address as part of the pension that's ongoing for this issue. Michael, can I ask a quick question? So the, the date of 1990, in continuous use, and the court referred to that, what is the significance of that date? That was the date that the Agency of Natural Resources adopted rules that went into effect, or went into effect in 1990. I believe the statute was 88 or 89 when they did that. I'm not sure. I tried to figure that out yesterday. <laughs> So the agency of ag, they, they have authority to draft RAP amendments right now. They probably are doing it. It has to be by rule, because the RAPs are by rule. So rule generally takes four and a half to eight months to do. So by the time that the agency has a draft, maybe they'll be proposing a draft to you, I don't know. You'll be able to see what the agency is doing. If you don't like it, you'll have the ability during the legislative session to address it. But it's very clear that statute takes precedent over it. Statute, when statute and rule conflict, the statute controls. It, the, the Supreme Court has said the rule cannot stand. And, and how does our statute, the purple box, compare with the Army Corps of Engineers? Well, that's, that's another issue, because the purple box is the, the Army Corps is, is, has much broader exemptions, much broader suite of affairs that are, that are defined as farming and or are exempt from the permitting requirements under the Clean Water Act. So that's one issue, the farming. Well, now we'll go back up to, oh, no, are you growing food or crop? No, I'm not growing food or crop. Can we just rewind for a second? So RAPs need amending as regarding wetlands. Were they silent before, or what's the amendment needed? What, the, they are directed to adopt RAPs to regulate areas as growing food or crops in connection with farming activities. But they didn't do that before? That's what I don't understand. No, they, 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 they technically had regulation over those wetlands that had been farming prior to 1990, but it wasn't specific to wetlands. It was just specific to the activities ongoing in those areas. Just like any farming area. Right, so wouldn't the RAPs have addressed them? Because it was a farming area. I don't understand the change that's needed to address wetlands in the RAP. Well, the change that's needed is, is if you're going to interpret this authority as applying to all farming and not just the green box, not just the growing food or crops, it's all farming. If they're going to be addressing all farming, it's going to be broader. Okay, thank you. Another definitional detail. So farming in 6 VSA, the ag title, is defined and you pointed out all the things that includes that ANR is not referring to in the wetlands rule. Is there a definition of farming in statute underlying ANR? Or do they refer to Title VI when they, if they themselves need a statutory definition, do they use the Title VI definition of farming? I just want to make sure there's not two statutory definitions that could be in conflict. I see that one's a rule, one's a statute, but are there two statutory conflicting definitions? Well, first there's about 29 definitions of different definitions of farming or farming or agricultural activity or farmer or farm in statute. ANR uses different versions, yes. They will either reference to an activity being conducted under the RAPs and the definition of farming under the RAPs is substantially the same as the purple box. Or they will reference 6 VSA, 10 VSA 6001 subdivision 22, which is the Act 250 definition of farming. The 6 VSA 4802, that that definition literally is, has the same meaning as 6 VSA, 10 VSA 6001 22. The definition of farming under Act 250 is the definition of farming under the Ag Water Quality Chapter.
So now you're here. I'm not growing food crops in the National Park. Well, there are three classes of wetlands in Vermont. That's one, two, and three. If you're in class three, you don't need a permit. But if you're in class one or two, you may need a, need a permit because they have been determined to be significant. A class one wetland is after review of the functions and values A and R determine the area is exceptional or irreplaceable. And class two is after review of functions and values A and R determine A, the area of merits protection. So what are the functions and values? This is what A&R reviews to determine whether or not your wetland is in class one or class two, whether or not it's subject to regulation. Now, class one wetlands, that's pretty easy to determine because by statute, it has to be designated by rule. And so Appendix A of A&R's wetlands rules include all the class one wetlands. So it's really not that hard to figure out where a class one wetland is. You just look at but for purposes of class two, what's significant that meets the functions and values that, the, that requires protection? Now, some of them are on a map, the Vermont uh, Wetlands map, inventory map. But some of them are not, and some of them are subject to A and R coming in and determining, based on these narrative standards, these are, are not necessarily objective criteria they might be subjective, determined depending on who is looking at them. These narrative standards, whether or not it meets a class two level of significance. Yeah. So um, this is part of your charge, because part of your charge is to look at whether or not the definition and the regulatory standard for a permit needs to be more objective. And what do I mean when I say it needs to be more objective. So I'm gonna give you an example. This is the general permit for Vermont, the US Army Corps of Engineers general permit for Vermont for development and recreational facilities. And you'll see that if you're gonna discharge dredged or fill, fill material for construction or expansion of development and or recreational facilities, you can self-verify if it's under 5,000 5, square feet uh, of permanent and temporary impacts in the waterway. And the self-verification is you send a form in to the Corps two weeks before you engage in that activity. You don't need approval. You just send the form in. But if it's over 5,000 square feet and it's in Lake Champlain, or actually if it's under 5,000 square feet and it's in Champlain, then you need to, to fill out this pre-construction notification. You basically notify the core that you're doing it, and they have the opportunity to say no. So these are objective. It's about footage, right? You're going to dredge or fill an objective area, right? And that is the, the question. Do you want this type of objective criteria? And it could include things like, you're gonna dredge or fill in a, in a bog. And, and a bog will be defined. So again, it's objective criteria. Not whether or not you meet a narrative standard subject to interpretation of whether or not the function and value is significant. So that's, that's part of the, your charge. Do you want an objective standard? Do you want to maintain the narrative functions and values? Uh, the narrative functions and values, it, it really shouldn't be how you define the weapon. Maybe narrative functions and values should be the standard for permitting. If you're going to impair one of those functions or values, maybe you don't get a permit. So, so those are some of the, the questions that you have in front of you as part of your charge. What about, Michael, um, under the, on the back side of your sheet, the blue? Yeah. Uh, provides the very first bullet. Yeah. Well, we haven't been able, and, and we haven't 
Judge James Strings in Vermont for 20 years in the IPS. Well, this says provides temporary water storage for flood waters and storm runoff. Well, it, you know that we we've opened up. We've left the streams like they are naturally supposed to be. So they're more full of silt and sand and gravel now than they were 20 years ago. And you go by some river bottom lane in the spring and you'll see river wa uh, water all over that property. Is that first bullet, is that, uh, is that gonna create a, an issue if, if it's used to grow through the crop? Well, um, as I said, this isn't everything that, that's applicable for wetlands law. Wetlands rule section five includes all the criteria for what the functions and values are. So there's more specific detail there about what the agency would look at for, for purposes of any of those functions and values about whether or not it provides temporary water storage. It's, it's gonna be partly fact specific. Shouldn't that be made more clear? If we're going to redo all this, is that an area that needs to be more clear so that if people are reading this, they understand that? That just because their ground gets flooded doesn't mean they're going to get in trouble with whoever that the regulators. Well, go to the federal. The federal standard is if you're going to dredge or fill, and they have a definition of what dredge or fill. If you're going to dredge or fill in a wetland, yes. you need to, a permit, or you need to look at the regulatory structure to see if, if you're if you're exempt or you otherwise don't need a permit. So, so that's that's that you don't go to this step of oh it's a wetland. Do we need to determine if it's significant or not? They they basically made determinations of when a permit is needed based on the square footage. Of disturbance or the activity involved. All right, so this is another one of those tensions, one of the reasons that you're in here. So if you're a development community or a developer and you're going out looking for, for reasonable, foreseeable expectations and you can't say for sure whether or not a wetland on your property is significant, you have to go get a delineation. And so you might hire your own delineator. You might have A&R come out and delineate it. And that delineation might be different depending on who is doing it. There are no what, standards for that? There are standards, but you remember it's, it's, it's people on the ground that make the determination. And what's potentially more confusing for farmers is that farmers often get their money from NRCS for structures and for other activities. And NRCS will come out and they'll, they'll look at a property. Sometimes they get ANR to come out and do a delineation. I think they're supposed to all the time, but I don't know if they do. And sometimes they uh, say, no, you meet the Corps of Engineers requirements. Well, remember, the Corps of Engineers requirements aren't the state requirements. So a farmer might go forward in reliance on NRCS, and the Corps might show up and say, no, 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 you're, you need a permit. And A&R might show up and say, you need a permit. So you have three regulatory agencies in play for a farm about whether or not it needs a weapons permit for some of the things that's funded through NRCS. So all right, so let's say it's a class one or a class two. You say yes. Is the activity an allowed use? A 
point, what are the allowed uses? Here are all the allowed uses. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but they are not the same as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers exemptions. And, and for example, the, the Army Corps of Engineers has an exemption for farm roads. There's no exemption for farm roads or no allowed use for farm roads. There is an allowed use for, for silvicultural roads. The roads that are built for silvicultural purposes in buffer zones and the restoration, reconstruction, rehabilitation, or upgrading of existing roads used for silvicultural if the roads are not increased in width by more than 20%. So you, you've got an ability to like say your maple stand, which might be in current use as farming, is gonna, you're gonna build a road to it for silviculture, and you're gonna be exempt for it's it, because it's in there, but it's not, if you call that farming, then it wouldn't be exempt. So this is an issue, what, and this is part of your charge, whether or not you want these allowed uses and or exemptions, whatever you want to call them, if you want these to be consistent with the feds, or not. And then if it's an allowed use, then you don't need a permit, you're exempt from the AR permit. But if it is not an allowed use, you need a permit from AR, and then you get to one of your other charges, which is the fees. Right now, the 75 cents per square foot of proposed impact of class one or class two wet. It's 25 cents per square foot for proposed impact to a one or two wetland buffer. It's $200 for conversion of a class two wetland or wetland buffers to cropland or for use as a manure pipeline used for farming. And if you have to pay the fee after the fact, after you've already disturbed the wetland, but before you got the permit, $1.50 per, per square foot of impact when the permit is sought after the impact. Hello? So, so this is a general overview of state permitting laws. The tensions are how do you define weapons, how do you address farming as an exclusion or an exemption, and if you do it either way, how you define farming. What are the allowed uses? Should they be consistent with the feds or not? And what fee should be paid for a weapon permit? Now part of the fee discussion is is twofold. Fees are supposed to, by statutory definition, pay for the cost of agency staff time in processing or reviewing uh, the permit application. But fees also can serve uh, a regulatory purpose, meaning they can be a disincentive to, to violation of the law. And, and these fees serve both purposes. They definitely are needed by the agency to pay for staff at the agency, but they are sufficiently significant as to be a disincentive to violation of the law. <clears throat> that helpful overview. Um, can you pinpoint what change has happened that has sort of surfaced this conversation? Or is it I mean, is it the, the advent of the RAPs or a change in rule or did the legislature pass something that we didn't realize would have an impact? I mean, I'd, I'd love to understand how this wasn't an issue two years ago and it is now, or maybe it was two years ago. Well, I don't, I don't know if it was an issue two years ago or not, or 10 years ago, or 1990. I think, honestly, what has changed is time and people. There, there's, over time, different staff, different interpretations, different decisions to enforce or require a permit or not, different interpretations about the language because it is, the law is not always black and white, frankly, it's 
rarely is black and white. Um, and so that there's, there's definitely different reasonable interpretations that people could make. Now, reliance on prior activity, if you're an industry like farming, and you've been relying on not needing a permit, and now you need a permit, that's trouble to, the, to that industry. Um, so honestly, what was changed, probably time and people have been the most significant change. So I don't know who to turn to, because you haven't elected yeah. a chair, so nobody can tell me who's supposed to go. Yeah, you have to hand this up first. So, sorry, Tom. I, I didn't know if Chris was bringing up the subject for those of us that get our tractors stuck in places uh, where we've been mowing hay for years and now we're getting stuck in there in the last you know, 10 years. And how do the rules affect the land when the land is changing because of the, uh, because of the climate is changing? Well, is that in this charge? And the, the agency can correct me if I'm wrong, but wetlands grow and contract. So what was a wetland 15 years ago for regulatory jurisdiction might not be a wetland today and vice versa. So weather is going to have a real impact on regulation under this field. And, and it's not about the law. It's about the conditions on the ground, as Hannah said earlier, whether or not it's a wetland. The, the issue up north that started, well, it didn't start it, but it contributed a lot to it was uh, the, there was a farmer up there that wanted to put a pipeline in and to put the pipeline in he had to go across an edge of a, of a class two wetland and uh, they figured all the way through and then he was going to restore it back to its wetland originally as it was and it was going to cost him like over thirty thousand dollars to put that pipe in fees to put the pipe through that, the edge of that wetland because it was like a dollar or something uh, a foot. The other issue, and, and we've taken care of that to, because that's going to help the environment. And as long as they put it back to its original wetlands. Uh, they can get by with a cheaper fee. The other issue um, was a guy that wanted to build a sugar house. And to build the sugar house, nowadays you have to have it at a low spot so all of the maple will gravity feed to the sugar house. And he, they built the sugar house, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers were in there and everything was fine gets a sugar house built and somebody from the agency calls and says the sugar house got a dollar. And uh, so that caused another look at the laws and the rules and the regs and, and, uh, and I'm sure that a well, farmer in Franklin County wanted to build a satellite manure pit uh, where they could get, take the manure in the winter when everything grows up, put it in the pit, and then have it there for in the spring uh, so they could get on the fields without running their heavy equipment up and down the, the town roads uh, during uh, the springtime when, when roads are softer, and that created a, an issue. But I should think that with our meeting times that we we have, we could work through this and come out with somewhat of reasonable solutions. So one other thing before I sit down. Um, so the, the Federal Clean Water Act jurisdiction over dredge and fill, the court authority applies to waters of the United States. And the Trump administration Appeal the Obama administration's rule on waters of the United States about a little more than a week ago. Um, that will affect federal jurisdiction, but it doesn't eliminate federal jurisdiction. So it's my understanding that the Trump administration. 
administration will be reverting to what's called the Rapanos standard set by Justice Kennedy, whether or not there's a, a significant nexus um, between uh, navigable water for tributary and this wetland. Um, the Obama administration had set kind of default standards of what is, what is adjacent or contiguous. I can't remember which term that they define as being challenged. I think it's adjacent. The proposed rule requires that the wetland be immediately adjacent to the yeah, traditional right. navigable water. Right. So but it's being argued that that definition was irrational and not based on science. It was subsequently arbitrary. That'll, that'll likely be litigated. Um, so there, there is a little bit of flux in the federal jurisdiction. It doesn't go away. And prior to 2015, it basically reverted to that standard uh, of jurisdiction. So farmers should be aware that even though Trump <coughs> repealed the Obama administration's rule, there's still jurisdiction on the core over wetlands. On the chart on the right hand side, that column of 25 allowed uses, what process has generated that list? These are all in rule. And is that a, a accumulated over time? Um, I don't know which of them were in, in 1990, but I know in <coughs> 2008, the WIG, the Wetland <coughs> Investigation Group, that the Natural Resources Board held, they reviewed all of them and they were either added or um, retained in the rule. It's an A&R rule. This is an A&R rule. It started off as a Natural Resources Board rule and then the board transferred its authority to A&R. You transferred their authority. Yeah. Um, say something and, and um, it has to do with the, the genesis of this idea to have this committee. Um, during the last year, my committee took a lot of testimony on wetlands. We sort of fitted in amongst our other things and it, what became clearer and clearer to me was that, and I, I want to thank both the Agency of Natural Resources and um, the Agency of Agriculture for spending a lot of time in my committee um, trying to educate me in particular. Wetlands not my strength, but uh, what became very clear to me was that there were, um, there were conflicts, there were contradictions, there were, um, you know, we heard about uh, one example of a man who, a farmer who wanted to change his uh, land from cropping to grazing, and this is two years ago, I had a very unsatisfactory conversation with, um, with someone from DEC who said that, you know, grazing is not agriculture. And I just was sort of dumbstruck by that, and there was a, a court case that was quoted to me, which I now I think I've subsequently found that was about horses. Um, but, but at any rate, the, the, the feed for this farmer to switch from cropping to rotational grazing, which by the way is good for water quality, it's good for land use and soil health, was going to be over $13,000. And we came back last year and it had gone down to $11,000. And then subsequently, after more conversation, it went down to $4,000, and then by the end of the year, it was at zero. And so, uh, I, I really appreciate everybody coming in. This, my God, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this, because this is what I really needed to try and make sense of the problem and you know what we were dealing with. So, that's a little bit of a narrative answer to your question, why we're here. Um, do you want to lecture chair?
chair now so somebody can call the next witness. Yeah. Turning in your recitation. Well, I, I would like to nominate Bobby as the chair. Um, this is this is a, uh, a committee that came out of the agriculture committees at um, it's in was was it five twenty five it was in yeah and so H uh, five twenty five so I would like to nominate Bobby to be the chair. Good. There was uh, I'm happy to support Bobby as chair. There was a, a discussion that I think Senator Bray brought forward that I thought was interesting, at least worth talking about, which was the concept of co-chairs trying to acknowledge the, the inevitability of getting ag committees and natural resources committees to flow together. I didn't know, to me that made sense, but uh, yeah. well, I don't know if it needs to be reflected in co-chairs or not, but like many of us uh, have over the years served on a lot of committees and chaired many committees. Uh, it, to my knowledge, it would be it would be most helpful if we had somebody like to be vice chair that the chair and the vice chair could work together. But you you still have one person to call the meetings, uh, uh, to do the odds and ends that need to be done by you stay in touch with the vice chair uh, to work with you. And, uh, that's what I would prefer because co-chairs, I mean, I've been in that situation before. Well, he'll, you know, she'll take care of it. I haven't got to bother her. They'll say, well, Bobby will do it, so I don't need to bother. And it, <clears throat> it just works better if you work with the vice chair, I think. Um, so the proposal I put in was really just because this has been a something of the crack and it crosses two different committees, I just felt like it would be helpful structurally from the get go to have the two committees that are going to have to come to some sort of working agreement to work on that agreement even as we construct how we're going to solve the problem, who we're going to call in, how we're going to structure meetings, and sort of planning it together all the way through. So I just, uh, that is my concern, that we not end up with a proposal that whatever committee leads that then the other one ends up not agreeing to and so we really have helped out our legislative colleagues by sort of coming to a pre-agreement in the form of our recommendations for that draft legislation. Well, I would respond to that by saying that my hope would be that anything we do, any you know, comes out of this as a consensus, otherwise it doesn't. So there would be, you know, unless we can come to an agreement where everybody is on board, um, I'm not expecting, you know, this to come back to the legislature and for us to uh, say, hey, it's all good if we don't all agree. So, and it may come to nothing. That's not my hope. Yeah, but we all hope it doesn't. Yeah. Would it, uh, Representative Sheldon, would you be willing to serve as vice chair, given the conversation, which would, I think, get close to what we're all trying to do? I think Mark has something to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I, I showed up here today to be on a wetlands committee and to listen to the statement of purpose, and, and I don't know which way the trolley's going. Um, I don't know if we're here to take a look at how wetlands are land is becoming more and more wet and how that affects our stewardship of the natural resources or we're here because the land's getting more wet and it's getting tougher to get permits to build uh, you know barns and pipelines and houses and retail and whoever we picked as a chair I want to know which which trolley they're on you know, or um, how do we <coughs> or, or does this trolley go in both directions I don't it's pretty clear that our charges 
we have four different items in the bill that it's our duty. I'm sure we'll cross all of the questions and, and we'll cover them all, but we have four things that we're basically supposed to zero in on and, and hopefully get a result. So there might be, so you say it won't be road, but we might get mired down. Well, we might, should, could get in the mud. If the wetland moves. Uh, so. I think there was uh, earlier, I think in this last session, there was a, a presentation given, um, I think Jeff Carter was one of the presenters and uh, Heather Darby regarding the changes that have been occurring. It was excellent. Um, and I think it might be, um, I know it's taped, it might be on video, and you may have been here for part of it. Yeah. I think Heather Darby was here too. Am I wrong, Jeff? Yeah. No. So that, that would be maybe some homework that people could do is they could go back and look at that. And it's about yeah. two hours. What's that? What if I missed the, what were the other two recommendations? Um, there was a presentation made about the increased um, extreme precipitation events. Um, we'll tr try and find that for you. Farmer, yeah. 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 Joshua Faulkner is our climate right. person. He right. described the changes that we've seen in the farm. And then Heather and I talked about changes we've seen farmers doing with their soil health and all that. So, Amy. <laughs> we have our slate. We're going to be vice chairman. Do you want to vote? Why? Well, it would be good. <laughs> should, do these need to be separate votes, or should I also nominate Amy to be vice chair? You could Christian. vote as a slate, I think. Okay. All right, hearing no objection. All those in favor of Senator Starr being chair and Representative Sheldon being vice chair? Aye. 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 There you go. Yes. Are, are you leaving, Michael? Well, I'm just I moving over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before you leave, I mean, I, I'd like to ask the committee if any others had questions of you on what we've reviewed, what you've gone over to up to this point. And if you, if you don't and think of some, jot them down because Michael will be back and, and uh, we'll go over this. I, I do have a question actually. Michael, there was, I think, a proposed rule that came out I don't know, a year and a half ago or something that also plays into this and that farmers in Franklin County in particular were trying to move to block in some way. Can, can you jar my memory about that? And, uh, if, if I'm assuming, I, I believe that's relevant. But so, so the statute gives ANR the ability to adopt general permits for certain activities. At, excuse me, the agency had proposed two different general they cover a bunch of different activities. Okay. Well, there, is, there, is a, there is a general permit that's been in existence for a long time. Do you, I think you're referring to that. Okay, so they, they were proposing a new general permit, um, and there was uh, some resistance to that. Uh, ultimately, you withdrew the permit, correct? No, it's still out there. Which one do you want to draw? So the farmers were true to the Yeah. The Dairy Association with true to appeal. There was a municipal appeal as well of the same permit. Okay. <coughs> um, Julie isn't supposed to be here until quarter three. And so I didn't know. Did you have any anything else in your presentations that that you wanted to add to the discussion? Um, um, so I think well, 
one of the things that, that you're going to talk about is uh, is the exemptions and and or using a general permit structure. So I, I want to just go and look at uh, the Corps' general permit for Vermont again to show you all the different types of activity that the Corps has listed underneath the general permit. Um, and then to show you how there are general conditions for any of those activities that are permitted for the general permit. Um, so first, you get a list of all the things that are, are um, covered by the general permit. Covered meaning allowed. So you get aids and navigation, moorings. Yeah, all land. these things are allowed? They're all allowed under the general permit and you can either self-verify if it meets certain conditions or you put in a, a notification if it meets certain conditions. So it includes things like mining. It includes energy generation and renewable energy includes agricultural activities. Um, so this is a is a um, one of the options I think that you have in looking at examples uh, from the feds and from other jurisdictions about how to address regulation of activities in wetlands. And then instead of going through each of the 21 different permits skip over to the general conditions. <coughs> so it'll it'll touch on both general activity. Um, for example, the there's a general standard of pollutants <coughs> minimization and mitigation and they give standards for that and that's for all of the activities so all activities that are covered by this general permit all 21 different sets of activities are governed by this this mitigation this avoidance minimization and compensatory mitigation um, but then you'll get to kind of more specific things like um, like the use of heavy equipment right so It'll get to stand specifics on how to use heavy equipment in wetlands underneath this general permit. Um, to things like mats should be in good condition, how to use mats. Um, so there, there's, this is a, a, another way to go about, instead of um, spelling out everything in statute, you could follow this mechanism where general permits are used and, and conditions of general applicability are um, subject to or required for any of those permits. So it's just, it's just a it's just a example. And not other examples which I don't have copies of right now. In other states the, the list of exemptions are are um, broader encompass more activities. My favorite example is farm roads. And farm roads in some states are exempt under their state law. And that's just to highlight to you that it's a state law. You can define the jurisdiction. You can define the exemptions. You can define who is, is operating the permit, administering the permit. You have that authority. It's not something that the feds control. It's not like the NIFTI's discharge program where the state has to meet minimum thresholds in order to run the state program because the core does not, or the core rarely delegates its authority on dredge and fill. Um, so you, this is a state law that you're adopting and it's not subject to federal conditions like the NIFTI's discharge permit is. The, but the, Federal exemptions, if, if we had a 
side by side with the federal exemptions, if we want to talk about that as a community, the federal exemptions versus the state exemptions, there's probably some state exemptions that we might not like, and we might be able to make that list shorter. Uh, there may be other state things that we feel should be exempted after looking at the beds uh, that could could help in the long run by adding them to our list. Uh, and, you know, it's the, our committee, of course we deal with ag, but it was our committee that heard from the farming community. Uh, we didn't hear a whole lot from developers and our intentions were not uh, to try to make it more difficult for them or make it any less onerous for them. What we wanted to do is make it so if a farmer wanted to have paddocks and a walkway for his cattle to get to the paddocks that you wouldn't have to go and, and do uh, a big permit that costs lots of money, and and so it might be good to look at that. Well, these are the federal exemptions up on the screen. I just called up the rule, um, starting midway down the page, sub section C. I'm not going to go into all the subdivisions, but the first one is normal farming, silvicultural, and ranching. The second is maintenance, including emergency reconstruction of these damaged parts of currently serviceable structures. The third is construction or maintenance of farm or stock ponds or irrigation ditches. The fourth is construction of temporary sedimentation bases on a construction site. The fifth is any activity with respect to the state as an approved program. Uh, what is this one again? Uh, I can't remember what five is. Uh, Six is construction or maintenance of farm roads, forest roads, or temporary roads. And then they give a long list of best management practices or conditions for those roads. And then that brings you to where is six? the last one and then they define for the purposes of the normal farming what cultivation means what harvesting means what minor drainage means uh, plowing means seeding now that all has to do with dealing with these issues in <coughs> right it's it's this is the the standard for exemptions what is that what activities are exempt and how to define them. But you also need to realize that the permitting thresholds at the feds, they don't require a permit for some disturbance. So they'll just say, if it's less than 2,000 square feet, we, we don't care. Um, and or if it's less than 2,500 square feet and you're not doing X, you don't need a permit. Or you can just self-verify. Um, and so th there's, there's that model that you can use um, that's different from Vermont, and there are other models besides the federal model um, in other states or jurisdictions. The, the other issue with that, it would be good for you to explain to all of us maybe, is in 525 as it passed both chambers, uh, there was an issue in there allowing Ag to regulate wetlands that are not regulated by A and R. Yep. And um, I don't know if the whole committee, um, you know, understands that with that it isn't dealing with just everybody. I don't think. Is it? Could you explain that a little bit more? Sure, so the, the language from that I think we have the letters that um, is on
for the ag committees, is, have you compiled what other states are doing for like how many of them are doing what's kind of being proposed and how many of them are like us with these kind of inconsistencies, or not, I don't know about inconsistencies, but it's different state standard or definition. I don't have a document on that. I, I mean, I've been looking at that, um, okay. but I don't, I don't. It's gonna be interesting. Doesn't have, you know, not, maybe someone's done it and we can not have them spend a ton of time on it, but. Well, the, envir the Environmental Law Institute does a um, weapons survey pretty periodically, and I can talk to them. That would be helpful. Chris? Well, he's answering your question. So, so this is the language um, and specifically see here. Remember that the definition of wetlands excludes from the definition areas used to grow food or crops in connection with farming. And that is in 10 BSA 902. So that exclusion from regulation for areas that grow food or crops in connection with farming is 10 BSA 902. This section of law is the section of law that gives the Agency of Agriculture directives to adopt or amend the RAP. So what this subsection does is it directs the Secretary of Ag to amend the RAPs to include requirements for activities occurring in areas that are excluded from regulation by the Agency of Natural Resources under BSA 902 because the areas used to grow food or crops in the <coughs> the farm. The key part of this is that word farming because farming underneath this chapter of law has a definition. Farming underneath 10 BSA 902 and the ch chapter that it's included in does not have a definition. But if you're going to look at the context of this regulation as a whole, which is one of the statutory construction provisions, if you look at all of the regulation as a whole, another <laughs> statutory construction provision is that you give effect to legislative intent that you assume that the legislature knew what it was doing and that you interpret language to give it an effect as opposed to it not having an effect. And then statute controls over rule, the statute and rule can be conflict. So there's an argument which is um, represented in the letters from Senator Starr and Representative Partridge to Secretary Tebbets that, the, that there was an intent for the Agency of Agriculture to regulate um, activities occurring on all areas used to grow food or crops in connection with the broader definition of farming, so all farming, not just what is the limited definition in the wetlands rules. <coughs> so, well, if there's questions in regards to that from any of the members, or if you want to let it sink in and catch it at the next meeting, but uh, it was to have regs on, I believe that's what you were telling us, uh, where there's no regs because A&R not, uh, does not have that jurisdiction. Ag didn't have any jurisdiction at least it'd be jurisdiction over the wetlands uh, for growing food and crops uh, in a legitimate way and by people <coughs> at the ag agency that are, you know, that spend a lot of time dealing with those issues. And, and uh, it, it certainly wasn't to make it easier for anybody because uh, we all want to protect our wetlands, uh, but yet we want farmers to be able to <coughs> grow food and crops and pasture uh, animals if they have to and not have to pay a fee. Uh, uh, Thanks, buddy. I think my goal, one of my goals with on the list is to have real clarity for farmers so they know what to expect. And, you know, clarity for everybody, but clarity for farmers, because, um, you know, the Marquis project that I referenced earlier was just, uh, you know, the farmer ended up, well, he may have changed his mind now, but permits for free. But, you know, that was...
is going to be a project that improves soil health, which also improves water quality, uh, but he wasn't moving forward with it because he couldn't afford the fee. So I, want, I really want clarity, in particular from my, from my aspect the farmers, so that they know what to expect and what they can do and what they can't do. Yeah. Thanks, um, I, I would just say I certainly share the principle that we should strive for clarity that I, I don't know if it's possible, but oh, <coughs> um, piles well, the, the, holes the, the overlap of just the federal stuff probably makes it harder. But I'm curious, it's been referenced that a lot of the conversation that I've sat through has been around ag, but um, there has to be implications for developers, and, and I'm curious to your opinion, Michael, what are the implications of <coughs> the, uh, let's call it a change of interpretation of our laws and rules <coughs> on developers as it sits today compared to a few years ago? Are you aware of any or? I, I don't, I don't know of any um, discrete issue regarding a change in interpretation. I think as I referenced when I walked through the flow chart, there's, there's, um, there would be a preference for more objective standards for what is a wetland what activities require uh, a permit. When the agency was in during this past year, they did distribute draft language that included some of those changes, <laughs> moving towards objective standards, saying that you don't need a permit if it was under 2,500 square feet half acre. Per half acre. Um, and so, I do think having that kind of objective criteria would be um, would be something that is attractive to developers, ag farmers, or anyone that's that's going to be conducting activity. Any other questions from Michael, Chris? Yeah, I, um, at some point, I'm not sure when we'll uh, like to see a schedule. It is of the natural resource impact because I keep feeling like part of what's driving the conversation is sort of a utilitarian view of wetlands, like how can I use them? Uh, how can we eliminate interference with uh, development agreements? And so although I get that we people own land in order to be able to use it, it there is a, an inherent natural value in different kinds of ecosystems and would like somehow to have some put things in the balance a little bit to say um, we don't necessarily there are places worth n not developing further or using further. For instance, livestock on land, and you, they can do a tremendous amount of damage punching up land and when it's damp. I mean, I've seen it on our own farm. I've seen it on farms all around. Me. So, but your horses are exempt because they're. In So I'm talking about, um, this is a general question, you know, like how do we, I get clarity and making it useful to people, but somehow we also need to be able to value under the law you know, this, these sorts of ecosystems and be able to say no in appropriate situations. May I respond a little bit? So you bring up a great point, and that this marquee piece of property that I keep referencing, um, what the farmer wanted to do is put a laneway in so he wouldn't punch holes in, in the pasture. And that required a $13,000 permit to start with. He could have done nothing and, and, in, and just not installed the laneway and allowed a mucky mess to be created. So. I think that there is a, you know, this is the conversation I want to have. Can I just, I have one more question. It's about fees. Didn't we address the fee issue for agricultural projects that are abiding by the RAPS? Yes. Yeah, so. We did that in the no? Is there more?
uh, we did on manure storage facilities under and certain uh, sizes. I'm sorry, you're correct that there, there is a provision. I'm going to have to find it. I don't recall it off the top of my head. Wait, I'm sorry, you're saying that, yes, I'm remembering that correctly? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I thought so. But I thought the key thing was pretty on the sheet, is not Lean back Part down in the left hand corner. But, <clears throat> um, but anyways, um, are, are you looking for that, Michael? Yes, yeah, it's, it's right here. It's the water quality improvement projects. So that, that, those are the water quality projects. Yeah, you want to see that cabinet? 22 and 23. Yeah. So I, I need to update the flow chart then because that's not on there. Okay. Um, if, if there are no more questions for Michael, I see Julie's here now, and, and <coughs> we're just a little bit off schedule, not much. Good for legislators to be within five minutes. Um, so, uh, thank you, Michael, uh, Julie. Um, so you're going to give us uh, input in regards to the um, stuff that we worked on and yes. on and still working on? Yes. Uh, so for the record, I'm Julie Moore. I'm the Secretary of Natural Resources. And with me today um, are Laura LaPierre, who's the Wetlands Program Manager in the Department of Environmental Conservation. and. Uh, Pam Smith, who is in the Office of General Counsel in the Department of Environmental Conservation that specializes in water quality concerns. Uh, and not having had full benefit of having uh, been in the room for the whole of the last hour, I thought I'd start by doing a little stage setting that I hope isn't redundant uh, with what you may have already heard about the important role that wetlands play in the landscape and the direct contributions of wetlands to area wetland areas to the greater public good. Wetlands are a critical part of our natural environment. Um, often when th folks think of wetlands, images of thriving marshes come to mind, um, and that's with good reason. Wetlands provide critical habitat for fish, animals, plants, and contain a wide diversity of life that's actually found nowhere else. 80% of U.S. bird species rely on wetlands for breeding habitat. 43% of rare species in the U.S. rely on wetlands for their survival. Um, and wetlands host 31% of the world's plants, which is a pretty impressive statistic um, considering the land area they represent. Um, at least in Vermont, we know that our best estimate is that there are about 4% of Vermont's land area, so certainly have an outsized impact. Um, but there are also pieces of wetlands that may have a far less iconic look while playing an equally important role in the environment. Uh, these wetlands primarily function to reduce the impacts of floods, maintain surface water flows during dry periods, absorb pollutants, and improve water quality, and protect lake shores from wave action. Wetlands are also dynamic living systems subject to a broad array of changes on a variety of time scales. As rivers change their course um, and erosion and depositional processes take hold along the banks, new wetlands can be created and old wetlands can be filled. Shrub scrub wetlands grow into forested wetlands. Beavers create impoundments that expand wetlands. Beaver dams break and drain significant wetlands. And human activities can have direct and indirect impacts on hydrology that also dry out or create wetlands over time. This is really right now a critical time for wetland regulation and conservation at the state level. Just last week, the EPA repealed the 2015 Waters of the U.S. rule, removing Clean Water Act protections from thousands of acres of wetlands um, and thousands of miles of waterways. The 2015 WOTUS rule, as it's sometimes re referred to, um, is the first step towards substantially weakening federal protections for wetlands. EPA's proposed WOTUS definition would basically only cover traditionally navigable waters, their tributaries, and wetlands adjacent to traditionally navigable waters. 
on, when it comes to Vermont, uh, 10 BSA section 905B gives a and statutory authority to administer state, a state wetlands program. And this includes the authority to identify wetlands that merit protection and administer a permitting program uh, for proposed impacts to wetlands and their buffers. That said, the wetland rules are challenging to administer, and this is really a significant program for the Agency of Natural Resources, both from an administrative and a legal services perspective. Um, just by way of, of quantifying that, uh, currently we see more than 600 projects a year uh, that need to be reviewed for wetlands impacts. This is up from about 400 projects a year between 2011 and 2015. Um, the average number of ag-related projects is, is far smaller. Uh, we believe it's about 10 per year. Um, and most of these are uh, as a result of land conversion to some other use, such as solar or a subdivision. Um, and most of those projects are referred to us by NRCS staff. In the average year, uh, we permit about 100 of the 600 projects that come before us, um, in large part because we are working with applicants to avoid and minimize impacts to wetlands um, to the maximum extent possible. And so by virtue of those statistics, I would argue we are really successful um, in avoiding the vast majority of wetland impacts. And the average number of acres of wetland uh, impacted and lost through permitted activities each year in Vermont um, has run about four acres per year for the last eight years. So a very modest in level of impact. Loss. That the, the, permit, the permitted filling or construction has allowed four acres total impact statewide per year. And how many have we gained? So I will get to that. <laughs> I don't know. You're, you're stealing my thunder, Senator Scott. <laughs> I'll keep going. All right. Um, <laughs> I've got those numbers too. Last session, the administration introduced a proposal in the legislature uh, that was intended to increase the clarity and objectivity of the agency's wetland permitting program, addressing what I thought were both some of the administrative aspects of the program that are at most, at most burdensome, both to staff at the agency as well as the regulated community through a few statutory changes. Um, these included revising the definition of wetland to be scientifically based and consistent with the definition by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, redefining class two wetlands based on objective physical characteristics of so size, uh, rather than a narr the narrative standard that we currently have. Clearly defining activities that trigger permitting jurisdiction, again, consistent with the Army Corps of Engineers, and then defining activities exempt from state permitting jurisdiction, including replacing the agricultural exclusion and silvicultural allowed uses with an exemption. These changes were intended to allow agency staff to focus more time and energy on proactive protection and restoration of wetlands. Uh, the proposed language, in, by and large, didn't pass. Effective wetlands protection is really critically important. The state relies on flood storage and water quality protections provided by wetlands, both in terms of being uh, protective of public, property, public and private property and to meet our water quality goals and the agency works incredibly hard to manage and protect this complex and sensitive resource. Wetlands protection and enhancement, sometimes also referred to as natural resources restoration projects, is core to both the Lake Champlain and Lake Mempromega TMDLs, the pollution budgets for those lakes. And about a third of the total phosphorus reductions we need to achieve in each case are anticipated to come from natural resources restoration <laughs> projects. As a result, we are investing heavily in restoration. Uh, for example, the Fish and Wildlife Department acquired uh, a parcel of wetland habitat within the last year, just in excess of 60 acres, and also carried out a restoration project at their existing Mallets Creek Wildlife Management Area, which was roughly 20 acres of hydrologic restoration and 10 acres of buffer plantings. Um, NRCS is also an important partner in this work, and as of July 1st, um, has completed more than 61 projects, totaling close to 4,500 acres of restoration. And there are two more easements um, that will go into effect between now, we believe, and October 1st with an additional 200 acres. In addition, the Wetlands in Lieu Fee Program, administered by Ducks Unlimited, on behalf of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, acquired two sites for wetland conservation and restoration in 2019, totaling nearly 430 acres. 
Um, and they also completed wetland restoration on a site conserved in 2018, totaling 134 acres at the confluence of the Middlebury River and Otter Creek. And this site will ultimately be donated to the Fish and Wildlife Department by the end of 2019 um, for management as a wildlife management area. So the, the restoration component is work is ongoing. It is really significant. Um, I would argue it's a cornerstone to our overall water quality programs um, and is buttressed and balanced with the protections that are afforded through our regulatory program. And with that, I would be happy to answer questions or allow the people who know all the actual <laughs> substance and details to answer questions. So are there questions for Julie? Mine's uh, simple. Can we get a hard copy of your comments? Mm. Sure. I would. I let me clean them up a little bit because I wrote on them, but I'd be happy to okay, provide you with my notes. So, how many acres did we gain altogether? I think if you added, including the, the additional 200 through NRCS that are scheduled to come online later this year, uh, we are north of 5,000 acres. Uh, I believe since 2011. But you don't know. We lost 40. We lost four times eight, so we've lost 30 or 40 acres. Um, but I, I so we, we, we are coming out ahead, but I, I think the, what I would ask, or what I hope is the take home message for that is, is we need many more acres of wetland restoration in order to achieve the phosphorus reductions prescribed in the Lake, Lake Champlain and Lake Memphis got TMDLs. It's an important piece of that work. But for people to say we've got to enhance these regulations because we're just losing our wetlands isn't quite accurate. No, I, I would um, offer that the, the statutory proposal we brought forward last session um, what was uh, designed to provide a, a similar level of protection that the current statutory framework provides but with greater clarity and objectivity. That was, that was the, the direction I had given to the wetlands program, um, and I think there was sort of a collective confidence within the agency um, that, that that's the, the outcome of that work. We were almost there a half a dozen times. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. Uh, Matt? Uh, how get big does a, a wet place have to be to be qualified as a wet one? So, uh, under our proposal or under the existing regulatory under the, framework? Under the framework that the statistics that you have presented. Um, so, it, right now it, it's based on, um, and I can let Laura answer this in more detail, but it, it is based on the attributes of a wetland, not a specific size. And the, the updated proposal um, that we brought to the, this body last session uh, created size thresholds uh, with the idea that those would be more intuitive for the applicant um, and also, uh, frankly, reduce our administrative burden because currently we often have to visit sites twice, once to evaluate um, the, the functions and values, the attributes of the site, and then a second time to confirm a delineation. I tried to follow that. <laughs> uh, but Sorry. If you, if you come up with a figure like we've uh, save four acres of wetland. Um, that depends in large part um, upon what you designate as a wetland. Correct. And if you, by attributes and other things, determine, well, that's not a wetland, um, then that doesn't get It wouldn't, it wouldn't correct. The four acres represents so the, the four regulated acres is wetlands. based on a, a process and a formula that um, I can't understand. No, so, so in order for us to permit uh, impacts to wetlands, they need to be considered class, a class two wetland, which has a certain set of attributes. There are other wetlands on the landscape, uh, often referred to as class three wetlands, that we don't regulate. And that would not be, impacts to them would not be included in that four acres. So Mr. Chair, I, I, if you were to def redefine your wetlands and come up with different criteria, and then go back and look at the report that you just gave us, the number of wetlands that have been saved would be changed on your report. It, it would be different, yeah, but, but the hope is that, or the belief is, it's not even the hope, 
the belief is that the framework we proposed um, in the statute at the beginning of last session, or in the draft uh, legislation at the beginning of last session, would result in a, a similar level of protection. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, so thanks for the report. It's encouraging to hear about the restoration rate being greater than the loss rate. Um, but I'm curious how we got into this posture to begin with. Like, why do we have so many more, why do we, yeah, why do we have so many more uh, acres to restore? How did they get to a condition where they, they needed uh, restoration? So we know that um, while wetlands represent only a small fraction of Vermont's landscape, about 4%, our best estimate is that we've lost 35% of the um, wetlands that would have been on the landscape sort of pre-colonialization. Um, so whether it's through uh, development of, of urban areas um, or through agricultural enterprises, um, we have lost about a third of Vermont's wetlands. And so the opportunities are represented in that one third. Um, to bring some of those wetlands back online. And obviously the opportunities are um, far better often in, the, in an agricultural landscape setting than they are in an urban landscape setting. Um, agricultural impacts tend to be temporary, whereas um, once you pave over something, uh, it's much harder and more expensive to restore it. And so the total number of acres, ideally, that you'd like to see restored over what time period is what? Yeah, I, I, I think we have an estimate of that number. I don't know more if you know it as part of the Lake Champlain TMDL, but we could certainly look into it and get back to you. Mm -hmm. We have a, a model showing that there's over 4,000 sites in the state of Vermont that could potentially be restored. That depends on uh, more details on the specific site and the land ownership as well. Uh, but there are many wetland restoration there's no specific target in the TMDL for how many acres of wetland we need to restore, however. And Mr. Chair, if I could just to understand a little better. So for acres that are eligible, that could be restored, can you characterize how they got to that condition? For instance, you were saying, well, compared to a pre-colonial baseline a long time ago, so um, do most of those acres, quote unquote, lost uh, represent do they predate our regulation and management of them? Yes, Most, that, that statistic I cited, the 35% of wetland acres having been lost with, was using a 1980 baseline, um, and really our, our modern uh, wetlands regulations went into effect in 1990 in Vermont. So, sorry, can you say that again? What percent predated the regulation? So the, the total amount of wetlands that's estimated to have been lost in Vermont is 35%, and that's compared to a 1980 baseline. <coughs> so that's really challenge. historic loss. Just to follow up, so when was the golden age of wetland destruction? Is, is, it, <laughs> is it George Perkins Marsh sort of era? Or I, I would defer to, to Laura on that. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, 30s through the 60s, I'd say, um, up until uh, the early 80s, NRCS was actually working to drain wetlands to have those soils more accessible for farming. Um, and so after 1986, there was a sea change um, within that agency with wetland loss. Um. Other questions um, for Joel? I just had a quick one that Michael may have known too. With, are there any uh, instances where if I'm a, a farmer or a developer and I need a, an EPA or an Army Corps or an NRCS permit type thing, does ANR accept it? No, so the, our regulatory jurisdictions are, are different. Um, part of our proposal is an attempt to align them to the extent possible, and in particular, make sure we're using a common set of definitions. Um, but the, the, the jurisdictions are, are distinct <coughs> in separate ways. Are we hearing a proposal, then? Uh, 
how we are we hearing the proposal today? Well, so I, I <coughs> the one that they presented last year. Yes, but none of us have been part of this. So, like um, the law that the natural resources committee were part of it. Well, you're so going to be getting it. You almost got it last year, but we couldn't move. <laughs> Good. Um, the um, yeah, you could run through. Well, well, so I have I have this high level overview that that's oh. up on the the legislature's website, um, and we did or yeah, the <laughs> royally um, updated this to to reflect a sort of where where we got to during the last legislative session, including some of the changes that were made um, as a result of of H five twenty five. Uh, we do also have a, a more detailed document that kind of uh, walks through uh, line by line almost um, of the, the final version of um, looking at the, the, uh, the full regulatory framework. And I'm happy to, to provide this to the working group. I didn't bring that with me today. And, uh, and are you working on a proposal for this next biennium? Uh, my, my hope would be we would largely uh, pick up where we left off in that we, we still feel like um, it, it sort of checks these major boxes that, that we were looking to see, um, improving the clarity and consistency of, of how a wetland is defined, creating a more straightforward process to determine if a wetland is subject to, to jurisdiction, having a, a size-based threshold as opposed to um, having it, it be more of a narrative standard um, better defining what activities meet, need a permit, and again, this is has sort of a, a two wins rolled up in it, and that I think it improves clarity, but it also um, aligns us with the same four categories of alterations that are considered by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, have a much clearer statement of which activities are exempt from the permitting process, um, and then also clarifying the permitting standards, which gets into the mitigation sequence, which is certainly a piece I know that there's a lot of interest in having greater clarity in, in the regulated community. Um, but that's sort of a, a rulemaking piece where that detail work gets done following the changes to statute. Um, this number six, empowering the consulting community, is one that, that was addressed in H525. Um, where we've been directed to, to start to do the work to look at a self-certification process and a licensing <coughs> process um, for consultants doing wetlands delineations. That, um, and that then so issue before you form the summit, uh, just this very day, uh, Chris and I are in a conversation where this person bought this property with a consultant uh, helping them along. And uh, so they purchased the property to put a solar maker, and um, they got folks from Lakewood to, and it's in the wetlands. And, and I mean, these consultants are going to have to be held responsible. Right, and right now, because there isn't a licensing or a professional status for wetland ecologist in the state of Vermont, there's sort of no recourse. Whereas I'm a professional engineer, and if I design a faulty structure or a faulty wastewater system, I'm liable under my professional engineer standing. I could ultimately lose my license. Yeah. Um, we don't have that same framework right now for uh, wetlands ecologists, and I know that that presents a number of challenges for, for landowners um, who may not get great advice all the time. So and so this, this is, an, part of it is, it, it's creating those, yeah. those uh, standards for what would, what a certi what would be the minimum expectations for a certified wetlands ecologist, um, and then looking at licensing and the ability to pull the license should, should that advice be offered. So where can we find that document? This document's on here, it's on the website for today. Um, and, and then the last piece is one that was also uh, work was done relative to um, in H525, which is looking at the wetland permit fee structure and creating reduced fees for water quality improvement projects as well as a number of agricultural projects. Um, so I'm happy to uh, share an updated or, or a, a 
pr proposed legislative language, if you're interested, that would cover all seven of these pieces and would be updated to reflect the changes that were affected through H525, um, but would get at that larger framework. That would be helpful. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to understand the numbers. Yes. My fascination with the five o'clock policy. Mm -hmm. I still understand. But, um, it, today in, in Vermont, um, as individuals purchase larger parcels of land that are agricultural land, um, the last several years, one of the practices that has been in place is to buy the land take a look at where the damp areas are in the fields and where you can't operate heavy equipment and hire someone to ditch it and put in the underground drainage, thereby making all those lands less wet than, than they have been and certainly less wet than they are likely to be in the future. When you share with us the gains that we are making in re restoration of wetlands, where in your calculations is the measurement just described of this, the ditching of hundreds and hundreds of acres to make them less wet. How does that fit in or is that just a separate category? So currently land um, that is being used for the growing of food or crop in conjunction with farming is not considered a wetland. And so modifications to the hydrology of that land are also not anything that's considered by our agent, my agent. So when you're coming up with the figures to demonstrate the restoration of wetlands and the <coughs> public might interpret that as, as saying, wow, we got more wetlands than we used to. It doesn't include the, the practices that are going on today that at the same time are reducing um, the number of wet acres. So those wetlands, I would argue, are, are balled up in the 35% of wetlands that are considered lost already and that they're not so how many did we lose in the last five years pursuant to this practice that i tried to describe to you? we don't know because they're not they're excluded from the definition of a wetland currently so which prompts me to ask how do we state that we're making progress when we don't count things that some people believe ought to be counted when we're trying to come up and measure so we're, I, think, I think it's a question of where you draw the baseline. If we're using that 1980 baseline, uh, then, then this is gains. I think you're right. Relative to pre-colonial times, we're, we're well in the hole in terms of the amount of wetland on our lands. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, it, when you're measuring progress <laughs> of anything, it's the baseline that is more important to well, determine whether you're making progress than the statistics that you get and back to five o'clock follies. But I think, isn't there a, like an exemption for a certain size exemption? Isn't it like a half acre or? In, in our proposal there is. And what is it right now? Is it just the 5,000? Is it 5,000 square feet? Uh, that's a, a threshold to be able to access a gen the general permit, I believe, as opposed to an individual permit. But the determination of what is a class two wetland and therefore subject to our regulations is currently based on attributes of the wetland, um, functions and values, not a quantitative numeric threshold. <coughs> and part of the reason for seeking this change is we feel like it would provide greater clarity to the regulated public um, and still afford the wetlands a similar level of protection. Um, so I'm assuming that the draft you're referring to is the one that was presented at the very end of the session uh, with a half an acre uh, exemption. It, we were in Senate Agriculture from the first week of the session yeah, with that draft. Yeah, we were. I mean, we were. Yeah. I thought the, uh, the drafts changed though, and we, we heard about one with a half an acre. And when we, we took testimony from some of the environmental groups, um, they were aghast and very opposed to this. In fact, I think one of the comments was this turned the whole, um, the whole uh, permitting situation upside on, on, on its head. So 
Um, I, I don't know what to say about going forward with that one. They didn't come to me with, with their the, problems. They may have got the Chris. The size threshold, I think, was part of the discussion throughout. There were changes as we yes. worked through it all, but not on that particular standard, I don't believe. I think there was square, square feet, more square feet, but then at the very end it was a, the square feet equaled about, a, was it a tenth or an eighth of an acre, which is not very much, and then we went to a half an acre, and that's when we had testimony from folks um, who were extremely opposed to that idea. That may have been um, under the non-reporting general permit, which was issued, uh, I think, last early last summer, um, and did create an exemption for certain water quality improvement product projects under our existing statutory authority, including animal trails and walkways, but also replacement septic systems um, and improvements to existing stormwater management practices. And the, the threshold for those improvements before we have to come into our regulatory program was a, a tenth of an acre, 5,000 square feet. Right. Do, do you have any type of a program to purchase wetlands? Because I know there's some agencies, federal fishing game, some of them have money to do that. We, so we do. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, it, and that was one of the, the examples I had mentioned. And I'll just go back to make sure I don't botch my numbers. Um, but the Fish and Wildlife Department um, has acquired, um, just in the last year alone, about 60 acres of wetland. Um, in, and they're balancing both water quality considerations and some habitat priorities they have. The Champlain Flyway is a really important asset for them. It, works out well from a water quality perspective and that it's also uh, has some real value for Lake Champlain. But so they purchased um, 60 acres of wetland habitat um, in the the Cham in the Mallet or in the Champlain Basin and then done some additional restoration work in the Mallets Creek WMA. It's not a universal truth that we would buy any wetland parcel brought to us. Um, certainly we work with landowners to try to direct them to appropriate programs. Um, we're looking at our, our uh, existing conservation land holdings and opportunities to, to build on sort of that framework that exists rather than acquiring remote parcels, um, in part just a reflection of the resources the agency has to per appropriately steward those things for uh, the foreseeable future. That said, uh, NRCS in particular has significant resources. Um, those tend to be easement purchases and aren't always something a, a landowner interested in, but there is a, a considerable amount of resources available through NRCS for, for wetland restoration. See, I, I think it would be beneficial to the committee if, if we knew of all these different programs and who they're, like they're run by the feds or the state, uh, Nature Conservancy. Certainly the there are private NGOs they working in the states too. Uh, wetlands, if, if that was maybe more widespread and people knew about it, uh, you know, some of these wetlands, people would be glad to get rid of them and keep them wetlands if they got paid for it. Uh, you know, the buffer strips that we all see around the fields, um, if people sign up, they can get a small stipend for keeping that in and strips and uh, farm people at least. And, um, because, you know, I, I don't know too many people that don't believe that that is very important. Um, you know, so, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just, uh, I'm trying to go back to uh, the loss of wetlands. You said 35% uh, in the base year was 1980. So, what does that mean, acre wise? Okay, phone a friend again. <laughs> or do you have a sense for what the, the how many acres in four percent of Vermont's land area, or uh, what the thirty-five percent of wetland acres lost would be? It would be equivalent to um, Grand Isle. Is that what 
trying to get at 35% equals how many acres? About the size of Grand Isle County. How much? Grand Isle County is what she said. Go look it up first. No, I remember the Grand Isle County, not the acreage. Sorry. Yeah. We, we can get back to you with yeah, that information. Yeah, we can do that. But yeah. re I wanted to follow up what, where Bobby was going, and I'm thinking, and you had mentioned that wetlands have um, values and functions for the TMDL load, so we have to go. So I'm, I'm trying to think of how many acres and where do we need those acres and what kind of programs would be in place. And you just talked about some of those programs that are out there. Yeah. And kind of take it from a voluntary, voluntary approach to meet our water quality goals and restore some wetlands. Yes. And you know, I can give you plenty of examples where wetlands have been restored and you know, they, they look good. It, not every farmer would want to do it, but right. on the other hand, some would. And I know right now farmers are, are um, cash poor. Yeah. And this would be a great time to have a program going out there that, uh, you know, we could look at some of those less productive lands that you could purchase at market value <coughs> or above market value. And I was thinking of that 33,000 permit fee that you're talking about per acre. You know, I think you'd find all the land you wanted. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me see what I can do. Um, uh, all of our natural resources restoration work, including the wetland restoration work, is, is voluntary. Unlike uh, stormwater permits, the required agricultural practices, wastewater permits, municipal roads general permit, all of the, the, those aren't optional. Natural resources restoration projects really occur at the discretion of the landowner. Um, we have booked a significant um, amount of phosphorus reduction associated with natural resources restoration projects, but at this point haven't allocated it between wetlands, riparian area plantings, floodplain reconnection. That's work that uh, you all excuse me, directed us to do um, as part of Act 76 or S96 this last year, is both to come up with coefficients associated with those different types of practices um, and start to give a sense for, for what the target is, what the magnitude is. And we're due to report back to you in November of 2020. So work in progress um, in, on, on that regard in terms of having a higher degree of specificity on the magnitude of exactly what, what needs to be done. Um, there are a, a considerable number of programs, um, so Fish and Wildlife Department certainly runs a, an acquisition program, NRCS runs some um, easement programs, uh, Senator Leahy as part of the, the Lake Champlain work was able to secure um, about six and a half million dollars this year to help us implement the Lake Champlain TMDL, and we dedicated I think about 1.5 million of that again to wetland acquisition and restoration through the Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, so there are a lot of resources in that space. Um, we need to be thoughtful about which, which pieces of land we're, we're both restoring and acquiring. Uh, ideally, these are marginal farmlands that, that don't have a, a significant agricultural benefit to the extent they're in agricultural areas. Um, and we're also looking for opportunities, recognizing they are far more limited in the developed landscape where you may have pockets of, of green space um, that have been filled over time, but could serve, uh, could function as a wetland um, with an investment in some restoration activities. So very much aligns with a, a lot of the, the statements you're making um, and would say it offers, it's, it's a work in progress, um, but we're committed to answering those same very questions. So that I also hear you're going to come up uh, with a list of the restoration programs and who has those, whether it's NRCS or federal uh, you know, for service or? I, I believe we may already have most of that information compiled and could provide it in terms of what the restoration opportunities are. So I'm happy to share that with this committee. Yeah, we could get that and Charlene uh, is our uh, person uh, in Michael. Uh, Chris, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I guess it's a little bit of a concern. I completely agree with trying to sort out the wetlands rules as they apply to agriculture or where they don't. But to the extent that agriculture is carved out, where it's, we're in an, an odd position if we start talking in here or in the ag committee about
about general operation of wetlands law that applies to non-agricultural lands as well, like development came up earlier, or permitting and fees and stuff like that. So I feel like a fair amount of work that you would ordinarily discuss in a natural resource committee about wetlands management has already happened in an ag committee, and so we're starting behind in this discussion, I, and that's why I feel like it's a little awkward. I, I now, we put together both kinds of committees, and um, hope we'll catch up, and I hope that a &R will bring Title 10 work to the committees of jurisdiction so we can see it and develop it there as opposed to respond to it after the fact. Well, I, I, you know, I don't want to feel bad, but I proposed to the Senate Rules Committee that we do away with natural resources and uh -huh. put that into ag so it'd be agriculture slash natural resources. It's funny, it's just yeah. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyhow, uh, no, I, I think it's important to, to work the whole issue, and of course our intent last year was to get the ag stuff in pretty good shape and send you the bill, uh, but we never, never got there. And hopefully starting four months early, we'll, we'll be ready to, to do something good this year. Uh, any other questions for Julie? And that's just, I, just, just I, I appreciate the, the talk okay. about restoration, whether it's themselves or stream banks or reparations. We don't have a breakdown on those amongst the three groups, which is perfectly understandable. How does the amount of money spent on those things um, compare with the amount of money that is spent on alternative activities like uh, the sewage treatment plants and the manure pits? And what's the ratio between the expenditures in those two areas? Um. I can get you that information. It's detailed in our clean water investment report. I think the, the ratio is going to depend on what your, your measure is. I assume you'd want to know it uh, unitized, so looking at per pound of phosphorus addressed is probably the most effective way to make that, that sort of comparison. Um, it's also, and we, we can get that information, and it does exist in the clean water investment report. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that not all of the money we have can be spent on um, all of the projects. Of course. Um, and so there's there's some other constraints there, but, but we can absolutely give you a breakdown of how the money is being invested by sector um, and the relative cost effectiveness of those investments. And so I guess the question I'm asking is, to what extent are uh, restoration and maintenance of wet, wetlands in better dollar-for-dollar dollar deal, we, so cement and rebar on the other hand. Yeah, natural resources restoration projects we know are some of the most cost-effective projects. That's why we booked a, thir a third of our anticipated reductions into that category. Um, they're also in some ways challenging because nobody's required to do them. We need a, a cooperating landowner partner who wants to participate, wants to by participate either sell their land or assume an easement on their land. Um, and let the restoration work be done. And so um, those sometimes take a little longer to come to fruition. We you know, issued a municipal roads general permit and then it has a clear schedule and municipalities need to abide by that schedule. We don't have those same kinds of sidebars and constraints um, on natural resources restoration projects. So while they're cost effective, um, sometimes they, they take longer to come to fruition. Look forward to the ratio of money to Sure, phosphorus. absolutely. We all set. Any other questions for Julie? If not, uh, thank you very much, uh, Julie. You're welcome. And should I send the, the items I noted you would like to? To Michael or Charlene. Michael or Charlene, okay. Probably, uh, it's to you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Michael, you'll keep it for me. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much, Thanks. Good, uh, Abby. Um, Sure, uh, we'll take uh, a little bit of a break, five minutes, and uh, then Ryan, um, where are you? We call the meeting to order, and um, Ryan, are you ready to, let's go.
call. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Well, welcome. Senator. For the record, uh, Ryan Patch with the uh, Vermont Agency of Agriculture for the Markets. And uh, I suppose I'll dive into uh, an overview where I hope to share the regulatory landscape that farmers in the state of Vermont need to navigate, uh, not just with state level land use policy uh, and the requirements that need to follow therein, but also additional requirements that need to follow for the commodity to of agriculture, food markets, and required agricultural practices to comply with state water quality requirements, as well as, as uh, Mr. O'Grady uh, shared, uh, overlapping federal requirements specific to wetlands that are administered by the Army Corps as well as the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Leading to farms are currently heavily regulated in the state of Vermont for activities they undertake on land used for farming. Uh, as Secretary Moore shared in her presentation, farming activities on land used for farming uh, as is written into the definition of a wetland in Title X, uh, is excluded from being a wetland in those activities. Those activities that are farming in that area is jurisdictional to the required agricultural practices and farmers need to comply with the requirements therein to make sure that they are uh, not negatively impacting or causing an adverse impact to water quality. But farmers are not unregulated in the state, where there may be an exclusion for areas that they are actively farming or an ordinary rotation. There exists regulations and requirements where they cannot convert unfarmed parcels that they may own or lease, and they cannot convert that to farming without a permit from the Agency of Natural Resources. That is the law today, has been since 1990 and you know, hopefully will continue to be the regulatory standard moving forward. Also, as Secretary Moore shared, uh, the 10 or so applications per year, and I'll refer to uh, wetlands program staff and the council as to what the exact number are, but for those activities that are occurring on agricultural, actively farmed land, a conversion to another use that is not farming is also jurisdictional to the Agency of Natural Resources. So I believe some of the activities she shared were uh, you know, solar panels going in or uh, you know, other non-farmed activities. So while there is a clear exclusion for farming and farming activities under state wetlands requirements, it is farmers are still subject to the regulation of the Agency of Natural Resources and they can't just go out to the and drain you know, farm fields as may have been the case from 1840 you know, up until the establishment of wetland protection requirements both by the federal uh, and state governments. So in addition to those areas on farm that are used for farming that is excluded from the definitions of state wetland and farming activities are therefore not subject to regulation therein, uh, there exists requirements from the Army Corps that this is a jurisdictional area that they regulate, it's a jurisdictional water, where yes, uh, as Mr. Grady shared, there are a number of exemptions to their requirements, but construction of a number of structures, even if it is a farm structure, as an example, uh, would be jurisdictional to Army Corps permitting and is not you know, excluded from you know, federal oversight. Similarly, there exists both the you know, swamp busters uh, requirements for uh, farmers under the 1985 Farm Bill that farmers need to uh, follow when it comes to conversion of land to growing quantity crops uh, that they need to follow, as well as when they enroll in a USDA uh, NRCS financial assistance program, they need to follow the you know, wetland protection policy that USDA outlines for the construction of farm structures in agricultural cropland that are conservation practices. And so for specifics on Army Corps requirements and USDA requirements, I would encourage uh, the study committee to reach out to those you know, agencies and get input as to what are the specific requirements that apply in Vermont to farming <laughs> uh, operations, because uh, I can't frankly really speak to the level of detail you may want to get from them. Um, but 
Yes, suffice it to say, um, there is um, overlapping and at times confusing and at times conflicting uh, requirements for agricultural producers in the state of Vermont. The required agricultural practices, as I know everyone around the table is um, you know, familiar with, are you know is part of the agricultural non-point source pollution control program, which sets requirements for all farms in the state of Vermont to ensure they are you know, complying with standards that won't cause an adverse impact to water quality. Uh, in addition to those requirements, there already exists in the 2016 amendment, as well as carried forward in the 2018 amendment for the construction and siting of farm structures, uh, you know, for example, in floodplains or uh, you know, setbacks from surface waters as well as additional property boundary and surface water setbacks for new and existing you know, production areas. So there exists requirements for farms to uh, you know, protect sensitive environmental uh, areas within farms and as directed by the legislature in 2019, uh, the Agency of Agriculture will be working on promulgating rules which include uh, requirements uh, you know, specific to those areas that are you know, not regulated by these natural resources, the areas used for farming that may have uh, you know, farm wetland characteristics, and that is uh, something uh, not uh, prepared to share today, but rather uh, something that will be forthcoming in the future. Coming back to some of the questions about the, not necessarily, do the land use makeup of the state of Vermont over time, I just, I did some looking into uh, historic census data from both the US census as well as the uh, USDA uh, national, the, the ag census that they do as well in an attempt to look at <clears throat> land use by farms in the state and what does that constitute? Like how much of the state are we talking about when we talk about wetlands, we talk about farming, we talk about development land, we talk about forestry. Uh, as Secretary Moore shared, you know, statewide about 4% of you know, wetlands are, are mapped and um, you know, we're looking at about 10% of statewide land is used for farming uh, based on uh, estimates from the Agency of Agriculture, based on the uh, amount of agricultural land that uh, we have uh, in our you know, database to, to analyze. So when you look at the, the change from, you know, one interesting thing I found, you know, in 1840, uh, there was six sheep for every person in Vermont. When you look at the 1840 census, that's 1.75 million sheep. Um, when you apply a similar but kind of different, you know, obviously it's the heyday of uh, the, the wool market. Uh, you look at the 2010 census, uh, we're looking at 4.5 people for every dairy cow. Now, obviously, dairy cow weighs more than sheep, but um, there is, you know, definitely a, a, a change and a contraction in, in the land use since the 1840s, when uh, one source says the Champlain Valley was devoid of marketable trees, and then you go to today, where um, you know we now have in the Lake Champlain Basin, 72 percent of the watershed is forested, 16 percent of that Lake Champlain Basin is used for agriculture. 8% is developed land, and then 3.9% are wetlands or other natural features. So we've had an inversion in uh, the land use in the state where the conversion and loss of those natural wetlands used by farming is now a regulated activity where farmers cannot go convert a wetland without a permit from the Agency of Natural Resources. So the loss and negative impact to wetlands that was occurring for centuries uh, is, is now a regulated activity that a farmer cannot do without a uh, you know, permit from the Agency of Natural Resources. Did, <clears throat> Ryan, did you just state that uh, the percentages of, of that land that choose for development versus farming? Um, I will run through the statistics again. Uh, it's, it's like double that shit. Like yeah, 16%, 16.6% 16 agriculture, 8.1% development land, based on Eric Smoltz's review used to work do you know what it was 50 years ago? 50 years ago, I don't have that information. I apologize. The, the counterbalance I have to that was 70% open, 30% forested statewide in the mid-1800s. 
Um, so, so while the, the share of land use for farming has contracted since that time, when we look in the more narrow time range from 87 to 2017, uh, the, this is where we're going to ag census statistics, we're looking at a decrease of 228,000 acres of total cropland in the state of Vermont in the word period of 30 years. Um, from 90, 90, excuse me, 1997 to 2017, we've seen a decrease from 95,000 acres of corn grown in silage to 81,000 acres of corn grown for silage in 2017. Well, we've seen a, a contraction in the amount of land used for farming and uh, a change in some of that land and a decrease from growing corn silage. Uh, we've also seen a, you know, an increase in the stewardship by farmers. Uh, we've seen a 124% increase from 2012 to 2017 in conservation tillage and no tillage. About 33,000 acres are now in some sort of conservation tillage practice as reported in the census. And cover cropping has had a double, it's a 102% increase from 2012 to 2017 with 40,000 acres now in cover cropping as reported by the 2017 census. So, Change in land use, uh, you know, decreasing amounts of farming, increasing conservation tillage and use, which is what the goal of Act 64 2015 was in many ways, and the state-specific cost share in conjunction with the USDA figures has shown a real adoption in those implementation of conservation practices like diagonal practices and you see in farm fields from cover, uh, no-till, cover cropping, uh, reduced tillage, practices like that. Um, the, the numbers that you also heard from Secretary Moore, the, you know, the last count last quarter is going to go up and I hear, you know, what she shares it could go above 5,000 acres is 4,488 acres are now permanently in the Wetland Reserve Enhancement Program or the ASAPWRE program. Uh, there's, there's criteria by which you're eligible for that. One of them is actively used farmland. And so we have a lot of farmers that have you know, voluntarily put their land into conservation uh, and permanently in many ways in the WRE program. Uh, in addition, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program is a program that has a 15 year contract and folks are enrolling for another 15 years, so 30 years of riparian forest coppers uh, being implemented. So two more points I just wanted to share about land that farmers manage. Um, if we're looking at uh, land managed by farmers in the state of Vermont, 44% of the land they report managing the census, uh, over a half million acres is woodland. And so when we talk about regulations that uh, restrict and curtail use of agricultural <coughs> cropland, it has impacts beyond just the, the parcel of land the farmers manage, and they manage many more acres. And that woodland very often has a lot of you know, important natural resource functions. Uh, so it's important to think about what land farmer manage is often greater than the land uh, you're seeing uh, on the landscape. Looking at you know, impervious surfaces of farms, based on the 2017 Ag Census, we're seeing 6% of the land farms manage are reported to be in farmsteads, homes, ponds, or roads. And so less than 10% of the land they're managing is you know, some version of impervious surface, so a pond to me is an impervious surface farm. It's in that category. Um, the land that the Agency of Agriculture has mapped uh, has a 1.4% of the land is impervious surface. And so when we look at all the land that farmers manage, a very small portion of that is in the infrastructure, which you know, feeds the cows, manages the manure, uh, you know, stores the equipment shed, and you know, has these, uh, in some ways, significant impacts to uh, land that alters the hydrology or that's drained or fills. Um, the land. So, uh, to Senator McDonald's, one of your questions asking about um, you know efficiencies of uh, programs. One of the reasons why agriculture is tasked to reduce 60 or is going to be responsible, or in the TNDL, their share of the reduction is 67 percent of the phosphorus load that needs to be reduced is going to come from agricultural land use sectors and one of the reasons that they were tasked with that is because of the relative cost effectiveness on a per kilogram basis for that reduction. The preliminary state auditor's office report that came out this summer um, showed that agricultural, so this is based on reported implementation from uh, the state of Vermont, uh, agricultural projects that are most cost effective, capturing estimated you know, 8.3 kilograms.
kilograms per 100,000. This is more than twice as cost effective as natural resource projects and five times as cost effective as road projects. And so in the early stages of implementation of the uh, Vermont Clean Water Act, seeing that agriculture is indeed a cost effective place to invest uh, state resources to have a tangible and significant and cost effective benefit for water quality uh, it continues um, to you know, hopefully be borne out by the report. So I, I've spoken about you know farmers are already regulated. Um, there, there's no conversion allowed. Conversion of non-farm uses is regulated. The REPs <coughs> provide uh, a plethora of requirements for the management of agricultural land, as well as specific construction setbacks to respect uh, natural resource features already. Uh, they're also regulated by the Army Corps uh, of Engineers, and USDA provides uh, another level of regulatory oversight for uh, commodity crop production. So as far as recommendations for the uh, four, uh, four questions, I suppose, that are posed in Act 64 2019, ensuring that the uh, exclusion in the definition of a wetland for agriculture is maintained, is important to ensure regulatory certainty for the farming community uh, in Vermont insofar as they know that farming activities they are conducting to comply with water quality requirements on land that is actively farmed, uh, they don't have to check with the state uh, for wetlands uh, oversight. They will have to continue to work with USDA and Army Corps, uh, but that is a, a very important consideration that uh, the agency would like to see maintained in any subsequent conversation about alterations to uh, the current regulatory <coughs> paradigm or the, the legislation that uh, controls uh, uh, the definition of the weapon as it exists. So I'm happy to answer any questions after I've been along for a long time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Chris? Quick question. I know that uh, at home people ask a question about uh, deep water. So if you're farming. Uh, I'm sorry, on deep what? Deep water. Deep uh, water. Tidal. Tidal. Okay. If you're the, in the class three wetland that's also in currently farmed. Can you tile such a space, or does that end up stumbling into the conversion issue that you were talking about? If the land is actively farmed, the alteration of the hydrology through the installation of agricultural subsurface tile drainage uh, would be allowed. It's an accepted agricultural practice. Thank you. <coughs> uh, the uh, the issue on on drain tile drainage, uh, we haven't fully developed all that out yet. But I I was under the impression from hearing uh, the federal people and and uh, that paid for a lot of that uh, had happened. It was so that the the cropland could grow better crops, and it wasn't. Uh, because the farmers were out there beating the drum that we want to do this. It was the federal government wanted to make sure that we had good uh, soils uh, that would grow good crops and promoted it. And I don't know, but you, got, you folks have done a study in regards to that. I thought you were in the process or uh, along with Minor Institute. Sure, so first to your comment about uh, increasing crop production and food security, I think you're accurate in your characterization that um, the you know, drainage of fields will improve productivity uh, and can help meet food security goals. As it relates to the 2018 amendment to the LRPs to include requirements for tile drainage, uh, there has been a significant investment locally in Vermont by multiple different partners as well as the Minor Institute looking at the question of when you go from an undrained to a drained condition, what is the benefit change to the water value? And the data that has come out of Minor Institute, which does have some different soils in, than many parts of the state of Vermont where we see classical tile drainage has shown that there can be an improvement in net water quality when you drain and manage appropriately uh, agricultural subsurface tile drainage. You know, the literature review that was prepared by 
Uh, the basin program shows you can have more soluble reactive phosphorus from an undrained field than a drained field in coal. So, it, it, but again, it's look, the finding the definitive answer as to what is the, again, it comes down to management, which is what the RAPs are about, is how do you manage the application of nutrients on the surface of the land, whether it's a drained or undrained field to minimize or you know, minimize the potential of non-point source uh, pollution running off of that particular field. Um, recent studies have shown that the, you know manure injection can have a significant, even over a tile draining field, can have a significant reduction in subsurface phosphorus losses. Um, you know, again, there are studies in the li literature even shows increases in total phosphorus from drain conditions. So. That the literature is interactive, that the question is, is a difficult one that we don't have consensus on, but the agency is funding uh, statewide sampling of uh, tile drains uh, to try to get a sense of what are the conditions we're seeing uh, in these drain fields and when we have a report prepared for that, I'd be happy to share that with the legislature. Okay. <coughs> uh, questions for Ryan? Would there be any enthusiasm maybe between both agencies um, for sitting down and saying, is there a way to expand the RMPs to include wetlands, both wetland you know, loss and migration sort of thing, and also wetland restoration? Like if that was included in the RMPs, and A and R was okay with that. I the, 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 the question, the, the REP set minimum management standards that are enforceable for how farmers manage land and, and site the construction of structures. So insofar of, as you know, incentivizing the conservation of, or the, the conversion of farmland to wetlands, that's definitely an area we collaborate and support. The RCPP program is a joint uh, programs funded by NRCS, the agency of ag and <coughs> agency of natural resources applied for together six years ago and continue to support that work and you know voluntary conservation. So I, I absolutely think that uh, that's an area of uh, we both certainly support the resources from the water fund or federal partners going to uh, the conservation and protection of uh, permanent wetland easements or term or a 50 or 30 year uh, what reasons depending on what, what the farmer would like. Um, the integration of that within the structure of the required agricultural practices, I, I don't at this time, I'd have to think on that. I don't, I don't, don't it's an interesting idea and I, I don't know how to meld that together as I'm sitting here. <laughs> so I apologize if I'm right. keep moving on that. Yeah, other questions? I, I do have a yes. question, Ryan, as you know, we ran into issues during session where it seemed the implications of the administration's proposal caught you guys who are working on the front lines off guard a little bit and, and you would raise concerns with how it might play out. Um, to the degree that we expect to see some kind of language from Secretary of A&R, do you, do you, are, have you, has that evolved for for your understanding of how it's worked? I mean, are you guys, have you fought through those challenges, do you believe? It, it is my understanding that the administration and the administration by me has come to a point where there's an accord as to the uh, regulatory framework moving forward that will work for agriculture as well as the agency natural resources. So I, I am hopeful that proposal you will see will follow my expectation that uh, differences have been resolved uh, over the <coughs> summer months on that topic. Great. Thank you. That, that sounds like it. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> we were we, told we that a couple of times last winter. Right, but wow. the, when the rubber hits the road, right, words hit the page, that, that's when things are, are certainly uh, you know, black and white text. But the high level conversations we've had yeah. now, the, the regulatory framework, I'm comfortable with where, where that language is hopefully headed. Yeah. But we don't. That's really good. We're going to hold you to it. 
<laughs> uh, let's, see, let's wait to see the, uh, the text. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matt, anything? No? Any questions up this way? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, Good seeing you. study committee. So, uh, yeah, likewise. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, how are you uh, how are you doing on your rules fair in fact and we're working on a proposal uh, we have not uh, filed with icar or do not have a pre-filed draft uh, ready to share this time but are working communicating to uh, develop a, a roll that along yes yep yep very good thank you yeah, thank you. Uh, from Julie, uh, the other another issue was um, uh, adding adding the federal agencies that that um, ANR, uh, uh, the NRCS, NRCS and those folks in uh, might even um, I don't know where the Army Corps. Is. But <coughs> if they have somebody in Vermont, maybe get them in to see what their regs are yeah. and how they match up with ours. Um, with farmland, most all the projects that farmers do are somewhat subsidized by one of the federal agencies. And if they don't get clearance from usually from the Army Corps that uh, that's fine, they don't get money. And so <coughs> I would think that as we move forward, we try to track our regs as close to the Fed regs uh, on ag land anyways as, as possible. Uh, we may have a few <coughs> things that we think should be different uh, or more strenuous. <coughs> but um, the, I know the federal people, um, <coughs> when farmers were clearing land a few years back, uh, you know, they all owned a lot of the bigger farms, had bulldozers and excavators and haul trucks. I mean, uh, the feds came down hard on quite a few of those people, and uh, I think the words out there that you know you got to do things according to the regs and the laws. So, um, are there others that um, that you'd like to have invited in for next uh, meeting or talk about the meeting that? Today's meeting, where we sh should go further, um, Chris. I, I've been wondering um, if you know it's sort of mentioned in broad strokes that wetlands are very valuable natural resources in terms of cleaning up water, but um, and I I don't think that's controversial. But I guess I'm wondering if to me it would be valuable to understand that a little deeper. So having some, we're not going to all become biologists, but some kind of impartial scientist come and just describe that to us in a 15 minutes. The, the thought being, you know, if we, we need to understand that to the degree we uh, permit development and uh, weakening of wetlands, we, we, we got to pay somewhere else, right? We're going to then have stricter practices, or we're going to have more mitigation down the road. And I, I, just to me, that would be valuable. I don't know. If it's just me, then we don't need to do that. But yeah. that seems like a be yeah, yeah. sensible. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the water quality. Yeah, just just really understanding like what are we, what do we get out of wetlands? When you grow up on a farm. And you're, you know, you've got something bigger than you. Yeah. You usually get the dirty work to do. The little guy does. Well, I used to have to go get 
the cow suck in the back that can automatically come. And I didn't drink. If, I, if it was hot, you get hot and sweaty. I never drank the water that came out of the swamp. Um, yep. I always drank the water I wanted to drink out of the brook that was <laughs> running. So I don't really know about the quality of that water that's coming out of those wetlands, but it might be interesting to have somebody come and explain that high yeah. quality stuff. Somebody from UVA, just, you know, some sense of the scale of the science, that's what I guess I'm yeah. But I also think that um, Julie talked at the beginning of her presentation about some of the other benefits yeah. of yeah. wetlands. Yes. And I think that that's, that would be valuable to hear maybe a little bit more about. And, and by the same token, I think that it would be helpful to hear about the benefits of regenerative agriculture and soil health principles. Um, and that's something that Ryan could potentially do. Um, because there, I, I really see an opportunity in terms of, of water quality in general for uh, farmers. And it, obviously, we're, you know, ag is going to be a major part of the Lake Champlain cleanup. Uh, I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit more about how that manifests itself. You know, what are the practices that can be put in place where farmers can be part of the solution? Um, because I think that is that is that working group underway? Is it ecosystems is that services services something? Um, Ryan. Ryan. Ryan has a clue. Ryan. Uh, Ryan Pash, UC of Agriculture. Uh, the first meeting uh, will be held on September 30th from 10 to 4 in St. Louis Hall, Waterbury. Uh, the press release is just about to go out. Chris mentioned earlier that since some of these things will affect the development community and we haven't heard from them, I think reaching out to them would be helpful. I don't know how it, what the current feeling of the state of the situation is now and if they even know this is percolating. Uh, yeah, anybody in particular, uh, the, uh, who mm -hmm. you, home builders, uh, is that who you're like, home builders association or anything? Uh, the Home Builders Association? Well, don't they develop? Or they don't develop land? Yeah. I mean, yeah, every they, time they, they, they develop, develop land, it's not wetlands, right? Pardon? Well, I was thinking about no. hearing from the other regulated <laughs> communities the that are affected by wetlands regulations. Yeah. Yeah. So. They don't build. No, they like to get out in them hay fields. They don't like to. <laughs> I'll think about who. Uh, it's the only one who are interested. Well, I, I feel like it's they're not. This conversation is going beyond the agriculture community, it seems to me, so we need other people sure. here. Uh, well, if we were going to propose something that would affect them, you're right, we're going to have them in. All right, so maybe I'm too early. Maybe I don't understand. But the early bird gets the worm. Right. So stick <laughs> with it. Uh, so what were you discussing about? <laughs> <laughs> We don't have enough time. Huh? We don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. um, We've got until January. Oh no, for me to explain. No. Oh, you mean we haven't got enough time. To I, I went to a went to a hearing up in in um, in the Ethan Allen way to get out there. It was about climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And we invited all sorts of people in, and um, I wasn't on that committee. And um, but and they asked them. So what do you think about climate change? And we invited a whole bunch of people in. And um, we didn't learn much. No? No. Um, we didn't ask them if you were in charge of trying to get to a net zero situation in 20 years, what would you, the home builders, recommend? Instead of having them come in and give us their list of, of things they wish to lobby the legislature on in the next 12 months. So I, I don't know what this committee's task is and what its goal is right now. 
Um, is the goal to preserve wetlands, or is the goal to facilitate their development? And I think it's to facilitate the development of all wetlands in the north. <laughs> Not have the one on one. <laughs> now, Mike, you were here when Michael went through our four, our four goals that we're supposed to be trying to achieve. You want to run through those again, Michael? Our, Clarify the rules, um, harmonize, recognize the different definitions that exist in different places. Pardon? So, well, what I heard him say was how do you define wetland? How do you define farming? What are we allowed to use to and what are we doing? It's on the machine. So, when. I may be wrong, why don't we ask Mike? When, I think you just. I, I'm, before I ask this question, we. Commissioner Secretary Moore was in here, and she gave us a bunch of numbers, and we asked them, asked her, how did you come up with these numbers? What were your definitions for your numbers? And she was quite candid that if you change the definition of a wetland, you might get completely different numbers. When we leave here, do we plan to leave here with more wetlands developed for Pipelines and commercial industrial equipment and uh, and uh, heavier farm machinery and more tile drains. Or do we plan to leave here with wetlands performing their tasks of purifying water and dealing with species and doing whatever wetlands do naturally? Because I don't know what our goal is here. Run through the, the four items. No, uh, before I go to the four, I want to. The overarching purpose of the committee is is in sub A is to clarify state wetland statutes and permitting under the statute. I think you can do that in a way that meets both of those objectives. So, um, so do, is there someone that you would like to get in? Because if Amy wants to get someone from the people that do have to use uh, develop, uh, wetlands to develop property, <coughs> we should hear from them and find out what the hardships are that they have to go through. I mean, if there are some of those that some of those regs that aren't important or they need should have others. Uh, I mean, we, we need to know those. I think what's difficult is without a proposal before us and a limited amount of time for this committee to work, it's kind of impossible to understand the ramifications of changing the definition of wetland, <clears throat> at least for me, because I have to take it when my committee needs to take testimony and understand understand those ramifications and I don't know how I could make recommendations without that. Without a document? No, without a sort of due diligence on taking taking a broad spectrum of testimony. Mm -hmm. And I if this committee is prepared to try to do that, maybe, but even still we'd have to review stuff. I mean we're talking about a much broader change than simply affecting agriculture. And no. I, I don't know those ramifications. The, um, well, anything that, that we were doing didn't deal, uh, we were trying to steer clear of, of wetland rules and regs that affected home builders and, and all these others. So all we were trying to do was clarify it 
and, and have an understanding, uh, being able to be understood by farm people and uh, getting that straightened out. Um, but I think some of this will seep into other, other areas. Yeah. That's your wet one, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think it can, and I don't. I don't know how we can evaluate it without understanding. Harvey, or Chris. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm listening to this discussion, and I. Um, for me, it's. Uh, it's about agriculture, and keeping agricultural uh, use of the lands, and I could tie that in with the change in climate too, because it's create some real challenges on some of our heaviest soils in Addison County and probably elsewhere in the state. But I want to stay away from having a discussion about what some of the potential use of that land would be. That's all covered, you know, under uh, A&R's permit program, you know, uh, Act 250, local planning and zoning. Um, I, I'm, I just want to focus on the future of agriculture, using that land for agricultural purposes, if it ceases to be an agricultural use and changes to some other use, to me, that's not what we're discussing. But aren't we talking about the definition of wetlands? Yes. And that's going to have broader implications for the entire state of Vermont. And specifically moving as part of the charge of whether or not you were going to to recommend whether the definition of wetland should be amended um, and should be based on objective criteria such as size and location. I mean, that's right. That, that would apply to more than just agriculture. <coughs> and the proposal that A&R offered last year, which did have a lot of agricultural provisions in it, but it also changed the definition of wetlands to be based on objective criteria would have applied to more than just agriculture. And what Julie was talking about is so that would be better defined. Uh, it, it wouldn't be up to two different, three different people going out and calling it two or three different things that it would be more unified and, and uniform. And that, and that very well may be, but without doing our due diligence, we can't be sure of what happens when we do that. And we need to hear from folks who do this all the time to understand that, and it will take time to do that. Well, we'll give them an hour or two. Yeah, I'll do it. Look what you guys <laughs> do. <laughs> um, but who who is that? Well, I think we, we'd have engineer? to hear from the we'd have to hear from <coughs> the regulated community, and we need to hear from the environmental community. And and in this instance, I think there's consultants it would be good to hear from who understand what is happening today in the field and, and hear from the wetlands um, folks at a and I mean, I, I, I don't think that we have a sense of the ramifications from all those folks. I don't. So why, do, why don't we? Um, so we, we've got five or six, six meetings. Six more. Six five more. more. Um, why don't we, um, see, I, the other thing I would recommend is that we don't hold all the meetings here, that we, we go out with our meetings and, and uh, like maybe the, we should decide how many meetings do you think we need or if you wanted to use them all, uh, would we have six or? Right after today, you will have five more. Okay, so we had six and also five more. That's, if we do uh, four hour meetings, three and a half to four hour meetings, that's, that's quite a lot of hours. And, uh, and <clears throat> like, I think we should do a hearing because this deals with, we're trying to deal with the ag stuff in Franklin County and uh, do one over in, on the other side of the state um, in uh, Caledonia, Orange. Windsor. Yep. 
<laughs> Isn't that kind of New Hampshire or something? <laughs> Almost half this, this group is from Addison County. I think we could. I think we should do it. <laughs> we'll do one there. Well, yeah. well, a lot of what? A quarter of you. Yeah. Three eights. Yeah, how come yeah. you guys all gang up on me? Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of wetlands. Uh, <laughs> a lot of wetlands. The, yeah, I think down somewhere in Addison where we could get people from Rotland County to come up a little, maybe. But at least for the next couple we should. But then maybe the third meeting out we could get these people to, you know, the environmental people, uh, the, uh, so you're proposing like public hearings as our meetings? Well, yeah. I mean, we'll take testimony from whoever shows up. We aren't going to just listen to Michael and the bureaucrats. You know, we got to make up our own minds what it's we're going to do. It sounds like a rock band. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you <laughs> folks think work. about that? I like the idea. Doing it some outside the meeting? Yeah. As long as Addison County's in there, we're fine with it. <laughs> you, you can find a spot, two. maybe down well, in that place in Bridport. Oh, well, um, there's several the places Grange. we can do it. We'll have to see <laughs> what day and what's well, available. The big deal on, on doing those meetings is not to have them right during corn season. You know, and the cows are all, farmers are all chopping corn. They aren't going to come and tell us their stories on what they like or don't like about wetlands. We, I know how we can do it. We'll hold them on rainy days. Yeah. Well, it rains every other day up north. Um, you got to get the right day. Chris? Would it, if we have the five to go, knowing the uh, wrestling that will have to happen around the specifics, if our end product is a bill, presumably it would be something that will then lead to much more testimony during session. So to me, I, I could see doing a couple of regional meetings where we have interests come in, invited in the public, and then come back to Montpelier to really bear down and try to try to work through if we start from the administration's draft or whatever, but I, I just, we also don't have a lot of time in, a, in the sense of, you know, we spent weeks on this in session getting frustrated. So I, I just, I don't want to lose the opportunity that this working group gives us. I do. Three out meetings and two back here, or two and three, whatever. But I would, I would reserve plenty of work time for us if the session was any indication of sorting through the details. It's tricky. Uh, Chris, uh, I, you know, following up on what Amy said about five minutes. Ago, other witnesses. So when we're talking about managing an actual system, an ecosystem that happens to be called wetlands, there's a lot of complexity to it. And I'm feeling like it would be very hard for me to talk about that definitional boundary, what we're including or excluding, without having a better uh, knowledge of the system we're talking about managing. And so um, I don't know if that means EDM uh, scientists, um, advocacy groups with a, a knowledge by Natural Resources Council or others who have expertise in the area. Um, I, but I'd like to better understand what we're talking about managing before we start altering definitions because they seem so small that they have profound impact on how they get applied. So <coughs> was Julie going to send us, you know, her recommend on the language change or the definition of that I think that the plan was to, I mean, the administration's proposal was presented during the session, and then there were changes that happened as a result of the committee discussion, and I, we can provide again the original proposal, but I don't know how valuable that is that went into what we ended up with at the end of the session. We could take that, Chris.
Chris, the proposed change and send it to these, you know, witnesses, potential witnesses. Sure. I mean, I think it's always helpful to have people look at something concrete, so if there's a proposal and people yeah. can respond to it. I mean, but I'm also thinking a little bit about basic knowledge, like uh, environmental science, of what are we talking about managing and how might it be changed if we change the definition. Uh, one other thing that didn't get mentioned, or mentioned briefly, was, um, and maybe this is the UVM scientist or something like that, uh, or someone else. Anyway, climate change. So we're, we, I know that, you know, over Addison County Way, when Irene came through, um, it was estimated after that Middlebury was spared three and a half million dollars worth of damage because of wetlands in Otter mm -hmm. Creek. So uh, they, there's this other big role they play, and um, want to make sure that we keep that in mind because so we're in an era of increasingly um, extreme weather. John, uh, I, it would be helpful for me by the way when you were doing your initial introduction and overview, you were talking about certain places on here where there were tensions. Body charts where there's like arthritis here and here and here, you know, the <coughs> glow. Um, and that feels like those are some of the things we should really yeah. be focusing on. I like that. Because that's what it's, it's, it's usually jurisdictional when there's conflict. Go ahead. It's the charge, right? Uh, it's largely the charge. Right. So that would be at least four. So, um, do we have somebody uh, at UVM that we could get in? Uh, I was just going to look to extend to in any input anyone could provide. Yeah. I think we're also thinking of uh, Jeff. I saw a very interesting presentation by Taylor Ricketts from the Gund Institute at UVM. And he, they had done a geospatial synopsis of all the wetlands in the Otter Creek basin. Joe reminds me if I get this wrong. And you look at all the farm wetlands and what would be the benefit of those particular wetlands being um, reinstituted to the wetlands and what the contribution to the phosphorus. So, so, so that was a scientific um, overview of wetlands and the function of where they are in the marshes. So Taylor Ricketts of the Gun Institute might be saying, oh, they keep doing that. Keep doing that. Yeah. Keep doing that. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Jill? Yeah, the woman who was just sitting here is an environmental consultant. So I can give you her card. She was going to email you. She's interested in giving testimony. She's a wetland scientist. Oh. Works for Trudell Environmental Consulting. What's her name? Her name is Karina Daly. Yeah, I, if, if you, um, you know, the agency can certainly provide more information on functions and values in the science of wetlands. Um, I also can give you a list of the consultants that we regularly work with. We would prefer somebody outside of state government. <coughs> Okay, so it sounds like you have a contact at, at UVM at Gunn that you might want to hear from. Yeah. You also, a couple of you, a couple of you asked to talk to consultants, and so Karina and potentially others. Um, and then the agency with more detail. Have some consultant names that you could send Michael. And then potentially a developer and then an opportunity for public comment as well yeah. at an off-site location? Well, I don't know if we would you know, do that one, that off-site. I think, yeah. you want to do that one? a great idea. It might be good to do the education thing first before we're off-site. It would be good if we could get more on the same page as a group on our charge and what, you know, like get this information before we go to the public because then we'd have more yeah, ability to get a knowledge. Share something with them, yeah. And that would be good. Um, I'm also
also wondering about, um, from you know, the little advocates community over there, I mean, somebody from the environmental community would be very helpful. Um, they keep telling me that there's no, last winter, well, you know, there's no hurry. You but Joe do it, and then, you know, we're here every day, so. Is your time come yet? <laughs> time is come. I can stretch it. Well, no, we should hear from some witnesses besides getting the details. Michael will hear it all, and he'll help us put stuff together. Okay. So, there was a witness we had last year, Natural Resources on Water Quality Work, talking about wetlands and dumping. It was the Nature Conservancy, I think, has done they, some. They should be some, like, uh, developed some tools for uh, analyzing wetlands and water quality impacts. So it might be helpful. Yeah. So we must have. We you to have a pretty full agenda there. We also have a few things that we wanted to hear back from you on. I was wondering, wondering how many other states have their definition of wetlands lined up with the federal definition. Oh, example. he's going to get that. I'm going to make sure it's on his to-do list. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to identify the tensions mm -hmm. and elaborate on them and then give you how other states How do you get those tensions? I mean, we're not the first state to deal with these kind of tensions. Yeah. Yeah. So that, if there are other states that have So we'll do, if we're going to have this crew come, we better do the next one here. And we could also advertise once. We've got to pick some days now for our meetings out so that, um, but we should give folks a couple of weeks notice if we're going to ask them to come to testify so they can you know, they're all busy, most of them. So, when could we, that's, that's gonna put us pretty near the end of the month, right? Yeah. 20. Two weeks, the, the, the Monday is the 30th of September. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have the 30th open, the 27th is open, even the September 25th is open, I don't, but that is an outbreak. Right. I could do the 30th. That's next week. That's the 30th work for me. I'm on another committee, and we had six meetings all sort of figure out, and we ended up taking a pattern for the first two meetings we said, and just floating in, kind of like Elkar, where you're every other Thursday. I don't know if that's <coughs> what I was offering that as a thought. So if this is, today is the what, second Tuesday or whatever it is in September, uh, to just stick. <laughs> that everyone just knows. I could stick to a routine, but I prefer not to today. <coughs> Monday, Wednesdays yeah. are great. I didn't bring them. What, 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 what day is our uh, two weeks from Wednesday? Uh, two weeks from Wednesday? From Wednesday. Second. 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 your vacation schedule so that <laughs> the, the, the fourth and the eighth. <laughs> Both vacation seventh, days? The eighth is out? No, the, the seventh is out. Um, the eighth I can do, but that's the same use products work hard. No what? That's great. 
see another study sure. committee from <coughs> So the ninth, can people do the ninth? Yes. Nine. Yeah. Going twice. Nine. The next meeting is the ninth. The ninth in Montpelier. Yeah. What time? Uh, we're going to run it a little different than today, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that starting work in the middle of the afternoon doesn't cut it very good for me. Good morning. How, how early can you be here, Carol? I work all morning. I'm here at 82. <laughs> Just to be clear, I have two hours to drive. Well, can, can, Could you not? how long I does it take so you? Ideally, nine would be good for me. Yeah, nine works for me. Nine? Nine? Nine's fine. Go color faster. Okay. Nine until noon or nine until one? Uh, that part, we could put it at one and so we can plan our time a little bit. But if we, you know, if we get Three done snacks. sooner, we, we will. Three snacks, I'll take you. So next meeting, October 9th, 9 until 1. Generally, do you want someone from UVM to testify? Do you potentially want A&R's experts and other consultants to testify? And if we can get advocacy and NRCS groups here, then we would like them. What about a developer? Or developer, I'm well, kind of going to put that into advocacy. Do you know anybody that? Um, I will, yes. And we heard, um, we took a lot from, of testimony from the development community on Act 250, so I'm thinking it might have been the home builders. I'll look at the uh, uh, in in general contract. You could get that I'll get it. to yeah. Michael. Well. Um, okay. Do you want to try to schedule your next meeting after I go? That be out. <laughs> um, well, we could. Two weeks after the day. What, what's two weeks from? I'm getting, I try and count my lights in a participation this year. Can't all these groups testify? When does the fire community get to do it? Mm -hmm. well, that's what we're trying to do. We're going to do. In the public one? I just want to. Is that what you're going to add? Uh, I'd like to. Uh, I mean, the committee will decide this, but I think we should do one up in Franklin County. I heard that. Do one down so in Addison, so that area, and meeting? one one over on the eastern side okay. of the in state. Those meetings, though. So, um, and that would primarily be, you know, there's Orleans, uh, Franklin, and Addison there in the orange um, that has all the dairy farms. And, and uh, so yeah, it would make I just it want to make sure we were going to have our chance. Oh, definitely. And uh, and then uh, I would presume that every meeting we'd leave a bunch of time open for people that to show up that want to have something to say to you know so we can hear from. Them. Right. So we can send out a press release notifying people of the time and the place, and we will ask them if they want to testify to identify to contact Charlene or myself to get on the agenda, but then we'll be able to time and other people. Yeah. Is that okay? And now what about the third meeting? What do we got for that's two weeks from twenty third of October. October twenty third looks good for me. Yep. And is that one we want to plan for off-site? Yeah, we'll do that one in Franklin County. Okay, should I try the high school then? We've had meetings there before. Yeah. If it's in August. Yeah. Any other, just give us some ideas about where you want to meet. You met down at the... Um, yeah, that was kind of out of the way down yeah. there. You don't want to do that one. Yeah. It's a hand-up. We could do it like, oh, this is a... Like, I, um, 
as you know, corn harvest is about a week late, uh, about a month late. So Franklin County will be harvesting corn the 23rd of October. They will. I, it would if you if you went to one of the less intensively corn harvesting counties for that first outside meeting, and they came back to Franklin County in November. That would work much better for the farming community. It'll, you'll have nobody there from the farming community the 23rd of October. So uh, we should do, well, Addison County's going to be in the same. It's going to be in the same boat, yeah. 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 So, um, so Orange County? What, you want to do one over your way, man? You know, Orange. Everybody's going to cut corn, it doesn't matter. Feel it's the best for Orange County schedule. I, I don't represent them. You do. I don't think it makes any difference. Yeah. You want to do yeah. that twenty third over over in say Fairley or something like that? Sure. Is that agreeable? Sure. Twenty <laughs> yeah. in Fairley, <laughs> the twenty third. So you met over there before at the, yeah. the, the inn. What's the name of that? Lake Moore Inn. Yeah. Are you thinking of the same time of day to be in the meeting? <laughs> uh, it's up to you folks. Uh, you want to move it up at that? 7 o'clock. 10? No, I just am curious. Like, I mean, people, I, yeah, people work. Clock's fine to me on those outer out okay. down. Mm -hmm. If that's okay for you. Uh, All right, so. So it'd be the 23rd, fairly. Okay, 10, 10 to 2. Or 10 yep. to. 10, we'll schedule it 10 to here. A, a little bit of time for lunch. I was just going to ask, do you want us to arrange to be together? That's nice. <laughs> we all the there. So 10 to noon, and then 1 to 3? Yep. Yeah, okay. 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 October 23rd, fairly. And you'll try for the Lake Moriette. Do you make that arrangement? We will, we will contact them with no guarantees. We've done it there before. Is that one we should do up in Franklin? Yep, that's, that's good. And so that'll give in. you folks plenty of notice to get. Since you know. Same, same time frame, or do you want a different time frame than Franklin? Um, well, that. That's a three hour drive for me. Can be what it so we'll start at eight. <laughs> I'll be there. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> Go up the night before. I will. I'll stay with no, the we kids. Can, we can uh, start at <laughs> ten. Ten. Okay. Ten. Be dark an hour early. So <coughs> That's why you got hit. My start early. So Franklin, someplace in St. Albans, probably. Yeah. 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 Try to high school. That well, the high school's not going to be available. Yeah, the library. I, I think the library up here has. Is the museum? 
for some reason. Yeah, museum. Museum. we did a meeting there once yeah, on water quality at the museum or something. Yeah, there. years ago. That, that's uh, Okay. I mean, in Middlebury, we have a VFW and an American Legion okay. uh, down in Bridgeport where um, they have the community center, the Grange Hall. That they have their town meeting there. They hold quite a few people. Yeah. It's up to you guys. How far north is that? Um, um, we can also use our new tunnel. Oh, that, that's a little closer. Well, I don't know. It depends on how they come up. But yeah. we, we get a good turnout of people. Uh, we could but use our town hall in Newbury. I mean, I can't guarantee it, but that's the place that's available. All right, so a couple of options is the Bridgeport Grange. The well, the, big, the Grange has a parking problem right on point the way and limited parking. Okay, what's the other one that you said? Where they well, the community hall is, is kind of in the center of town. Bridgeport Community Hall in Middlebury Town Hall, is that what it was? Those are three options. We've done it at the Bridgeport Community Hall before and at the VFW before, so they're, they're big. So we need a big, big, big So it'll be in Middlebury or if we can get the space on the 20th. We'll look at Bridgeport Community Hall. And then should we do the yeah. last one on December 4th here? Yeah. So we're just doing one here after? No, I think here and then here. Here. Yeah. So we'll do three here. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so you'll get worried out. <coughs> we will work on that for the next year. Check with uh, well, Jack and uh, like Farm Bureau, they have uh, county meetings in the fall, and maybe we could have them uh, make this a, a notice available to the farmers at their county meetings. My notice will go out at the end of this week. I'll send a note out of all the meetings listed. Right now, we're the only two that we can put in actually the Washington. Farmers Alliance group. That, you know, it's good that it works. It's out ahead of time so they can mark these dates down and, and, and show up. Yeah, very good. Appreciate it. Uh, anything? Anything else that anyone would like to bring up? Maybe I guess you yeah, just invited me to so five different things. I, when I set it up, it invited you off. I don't need to go to dinner. Is that true? You're paying. I mean, if he's paying, let's go. Uh, if there's a. Is there anything else? No, I don't. Thank you. Jackie? Um, see, the other thing I, I might suggest is we've got October 23rd is fairly late Morgan. That is foliage still, so you might want to come up with another location. Oh, location? Because they might, I, I think it might be posted. 
Well, they oh, still have bosses that come. Well, I'm just that saying. That doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Where? Yeah. I'll help you. Yeah.